We are live in YouTube now. Well, so 1.30. Uh, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm opening the afternoon session of our workshop. Uh, like I did yesterday, uh, I would like to invite Professor Fernando Marques to present uh, uh, your uh, his second le uh, sec second lecture today. Please, Professor, could you share your slides? Thank you. Thank you. So you should be getting my slides now. Yes. Let's see if I can move to full screen. Now full screen, I imagine. Yes, perfect. Is that correct? Right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay, if something goes wrong, I just ask someone to, to tell me something so that I can try to fix it. So uh, good afternoon to everybody there. Uh, for those that survived to yesterday seminar, uh, you'll find out that today we are going to talk on a similar subject, although with uh, some differences normally. Uh, so the, the title of the talk, you know, it is, is on electrochemical membranes, and we are going to talk about the second example, which is the CO2 separation membranes. If someone is just seeing for the first time these seminars, just to recall you that um, uh, my former position was as a, a professor at the University of Aveiro in Portugal. Then I, I became retired from there last year, although I keep some activity with some, some people working there. And I joined the, the Federal University of Paraíba in Brazil in the, the Department of uh, Engineering, uh, Materials Engineering as well. So, my present affiliation is as visiting professor in, in Brazil, actually. So uh, yesterday we, we had the chance to go through several aspects of the membranes for partial oxidation of methane. And uh, today I, I'm really going to emphasize the entire talk on membranes for CO2 separation. The, they have in common that they are electrochemical membranes and they have a few more aspects in mechanisms uh, which are similar. And this means that this is really a, an interesting package with some uh, consistency. So today I will recall just very shortly some of the issues that we have discussed yesterday. Uh, then I will move to the model behavior once again. I, I always insist a little bit on this aspect because we must understand uh, uh, as engineers, we must understand what, what are the, the parameters that we can change to obtain the performance that we want. Then I will spend a little bit on uh, materials, what kind of materials, how can we uh, make these materials. We are talking about composite materials. There are many solutions to prepare these composite materials. And I will very shortly show you a little bit about characterization, mostly electrical characterization. So, and impedance spectroscopy that we just had a few words yesterday also on this. Then I will move to another subject, which is very important for me, which is benchmarking, which is always to say, how are we with respect to other people? Or how are we with respect to what should be the ideal performance of a given membrane? Uh, when we use materials that we know, we can always establish targets that are based on models, obviously. And we can see how far or how close we are from the, the target values that we want for the performance of our systems or devices. And then I will end up this uh, presentation today with a little bit of uh, my present ideas. This is a, a kind of an ongoing research subject, and uh, there are many interesting developments that we can consider for the future. And I will show you some recently published and even some unpublished results uh, uh, on things that we are doing. And then I will end up with the, with the conclusions. So, recalling very quickly the problem, the problem is that we are we have growing emissions of CO2 worldwide. Uh, the emissions are, are really uh, getting enormous and they have a, a huge impact on climate. Uh, uh, we all suffer nowadays from all kinds of problems because of this kind of uh, uh, climate changes. 
And so this is a, a real concern, the level of emissions of CO2. Uh, one of the solutions to try to avoid these emissions of CO2 is to move to what we call the hydrogen economy and the hydrogen technologies and things like that. This means that we need hydrogen. We can have hydrogen from steam electrolysis and uh, we can use renewable energy uh, to, to have this steam electrolysis running. That, that's really the, the beautiful solution that we can all uh, envisage. Uh, but we can also go for biofuels, bioethanol, as you do in Brazil. And then we have to do the conversion of ethanol into hydrogen. And uh, in the end, because the molecule of ethanol has two carbons, we end up also with some CO2. So we, we need to separate at some point the CO2 from the process we, if we want to use just the pure hydrogen. Now, hydrogen nowadays is produced mostly from methane. It's a, a process that we discussed yesterday. And one of the solutions is to uh, go step by step. Firstly, a partial oxidation, and we get carbon monoxide. And then we go for water gas shift reaction, and we get CO2 in the end, CO2 with hydrogen. And again, we would like to have uh, this CO2 uh, uh, separated from the hydrogen so that we can use hydrogen as fuel directly. So the separation of CO2 is a real important issue. Uh, there is a, a big prize offered recently by, by someone in the United States uh, for someone that develops a really innovative CO2 technology, and it's a huge amount of money. So for those people interested, uh, I just suggest that you look for, for, for the idea, and maybe you can become a rich man, which is very unusual for people in science. But if you get the good idea, probably you'll get this prize. So let's talk a little bit about CO2 separation membranes now. And uh, what I wanted to show you is the mechanism of these CO2 separation membranes. If you remember a scheme that I presented yesterday on uh, partial oxidation of methane, this scheme has some analogy because what we have in our membrane, as you can see, we have two different species. One, which is the carbonate ion, uh, uh, and the other one, which is the oxide ion in dark blue. And what we have in the operation of this membrane is that the molecule of CO2 in the atmosphere can pick one oxide ion when it, the, the, the CO2 molecule touches the membrane, can pick one oxide ion and move across the molten carbonates. Uh, that's the carbonate ion conductor. So the, the carbonate ion can move up across the molten carbonates to the other side of the membrane will release again the oxide ion and uh, will go to the atmosphere and the oxide ion will travel back inside the membrane. And so what we have is a net transfer of CO2 from one side of the membrane to the other side of the membrane. And inside the membrane, we have a counter flow of oxide ions and carbonate ions. The oxide ions travel within a ceramic skeleton, which is an oxide ion conductor, and the carbonate ions travel uh, throughout the molten phase, which is uh, a mixture usually of alkali metal carbonates, which have a reasonably low melting point. So we have two ionic conductors, two electrolytes. One is an oxide in this picture that you see here in this scheme. The oxide is the light gray area and the molten carbonates are the dark gray area. So we have again a problem of ambipolar uh, transport and bipolar conductivity. So we have two different charged species just moving in opposite directions inside the membrane. We don't need the electrode materials. Everything is going on inside the membrane. And the fact that the process is governed by ionic transport, it's also a very uh, selective process. So it's fully selective with respect to CO2. So it's a, a very interesting technological solution. So. Uh, the, the operation temperature of these membranes is in the order of 500, 600 centigrade nowadays with the state of the art materials and technology that we have. And uh, the problem that we have with these membranes is that we need to have the same flow of carbonate ions and oxide ions. And to optimize this, we should have very high conductivities, ionic conductivities of the ceramic phase and the molten carbonate phase. But we know from facts, and these systems are studied for many years, that the ionic conductivity of the molten carbonates is much larger than the ionic conductivity of the oxide phase. And so we have here really our constraining factor that we have to deal with when we are doing the design uh, uh, of these membranes and trying to 
produce high-performance membranes. Okay, so uh, if you recall also what I said yesterday about materials, I, I like very much what I, co I call complex or heterogeneous materials. And in this case, we are talking about composite materials. So we have an oxide and we have a molten phase. And so we are going to uh, try to show you a little bit how we can handle uh, or deal with these materials and try to optimize their, their uh, performance. These materials are very well known. The oxides that we are using in these membranes were studied for many, many years as part of the so-called solid oxide fuel cells, uh, which is a well-known uh, system. Uh, one of the best known electrolytes is the, the uh, yttrium stabilized zirconia, but the operating temperature is, is very high. And so an alternative to yttrium stabilized zirconia are the, the ciria, doped, doped ciria as alternative that can operate at temperatures of 600, 700 centigrades and are uh, really interesting uh, alternative materials as ceramic oxide ion conductors. For the molten carbonates, you have usually eutetic mixtures of the alkali metal uh, carbonates. And this means mixtures of sodium and lithium carbonate or sodium and the lithium and potassium carbonate, whatever. And then as these materials have uh, eutetic uh, temperatures, uh, uh, which are reasonably low in the range of 400, 500 centigrades, you can operate the molten carbonate fuel cells at a uh, uh, much lower temperature than you can reach usually with the solid oxide fuel cells. But mostly this is to say that the materials that we are using in these membranes are well studied. And uh, I'm just using here a scheme that was uh, published by Professor Steele uh, some 20 years ago, which is very interesting and schematic about the type of fuel cells and operating temperature. So nothing new about the materials, but a lot new about the functionality of these combined materials. If you remember what I said yesterday, I talked about the uh, membranes for the partial oxidation of methane, and that was a subject that I've studied about some 20 years ago. And this is uh, one of the, uh, the membranes for CO2 separation are one of the subjects that I'm really interested up to now. So you are going to see very recent results. And you can see, uh, this is a small list of uh, uh, papers that we published on these materials. And they were used as reference for the figures and the, the, the graphs that you are going to see throughout this presentation. So model performance. Uh, you might remember as well from yesterday that I'm very uh, uh, fond of uh, what I call the equivalent circuits, which are a very interesting way to describe uh, these kinds of cells. And uh, the interesting thing about these membranes is that we have a molten carbonate phase that you see here, the schematic of the equivalent circuit for a molten carbonate phase, which is the upper blue area of this uh, diagram. And you have a, a solid oxide uh, uh, phase and the schematic for the solid oxide fuel cell would be this lower yellowish area of the diagram. So in fact, what we have is two uh, fuel cells to a certain extent in parallel, because we have parallel pathways for the oxide ions and for the carbonate ions inside the, the cell. But at the same time, there is no current outside the system. And so this means that the current in the molten carbonates must somehow com combine with the current in the solid oxide phase. When we are handling the, the so-called equivalent circuits, it is usually important to consider that we have an ionic branch, which is the upper one in solid lines. And we also have an electronic branch, which is the low, lower one in dotted lines. So you see the same kind of approach for both kinds of cells. But I should say immediately that as we are talking about electrolytes, either molten or solid electrolytes, the ionic conductivity is a lot higher than the electronic conductivity. So these materials, from an electronic point of view, they are insulators. So we can just discard, let's say, to, to neglect the existence of any electronic conductivity in these materials, which brings us to the point where the circuit is simplified just to the upper branch and the lower branch, just with the, the voltage, the thermodynamic voltage in the molten carbonate cell, the thermodynamic voltage in the solid oxide cell, then the resistance of the molten carbonates, the resistance of the solid oxides, and the corresponding currents. So the reactions that we have, you saw reactions before. So in the feed side, which is in our case in this diagram, the right-hand side of the diagram, we have CO2 combining with oxygen. 
and eventually with the electrons to form the CO3 or the carbonate ions. And uh, we also have the oxide ions just uh, uh, releasing the electrons and uh, forming oxygen and uh, uh, four electrons. In the other side, we have exactly the opposite uh, uh, direction of reactions. And if we sum up the reactions in both sides, you end up seeing the feed side uh, uh, overall reaction, which is the CO2 combining with oxide ions to form the carbonate ions. And in the other side, which is the permeate side of the membrane, you see the carbonates just originating the formation of CO2 molecules and oxide ions. So this is the global scheme, and this is the global model that we can have for this system. As I said before, we have two thermodynamic voltages. We can determine the thermodynamic voltages, which are well known and established in the literature for these two cells. And for the molten carbonate fuel cell, you have the thermodynamic voltage is a function of the partial pressures of oxygen of CO2 in the feed and in the permeate side, but also of the oxygen in the feed and the permeate side, while for the solid oxide cell, the, the thermodynamic voltage is just a function of the oxygen partial pressures in the feed and the permeate side. So as you can see, this term here involving oxygen is exactly the same in both uh, uh, cells. And this has a, an important consequence. And the consequence is this one. When we operate a membrane like this, usually the molten carbonate cell is operating in the galvanic mode while the solid oxide fuel cell is operating in the electrolytic mode. Remember that the carbonate ions are moving in one direction and the oxide ions are moving in the other direction. So the uh, carbonate ions are moving in the direction of decreasing CO2 activity, while the oxide ions are moving in the direction of increasing oxygen activity. This is the reason why one of the uh, cells is operating in the galvanic mode and the other one is operating in the electrolytic mode. And then we can combine a number of things. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this, but just to tell you that since there is no external circuit, everything is inside the membrane. So the total voltage in the molten carbonate fuel cell should be the same as in the solid oxide fuel cell. And as the currents are somehow in series because the, the current of the carbonates is going to be converted in current of oxide ions. So this means that there is also one single current. And when you just mix all these equations together, you end up with the important one, which is this one, that tells you the overall current inside the cell, either carbonate ions or oxide ions, but the important one are the carbonate ions, because those correspond to the CO2, which is moving from one side of the membrane to the other side of the membrane. But I was just saying that the current inside the membrane is due to what we just introduced yesterday, which is the ambipolar conductivity, which here has a slightly different expression. We'll have a look at this later. Then we have here a term where the, the, the driving force, the CO2 uh, gradient, is appearing. And then we have parameters which have to do with the operating conditions. If we look at this equation in more detail, and now we have your emphasis on the different contributions for the total current. So we have the total current I, which will be a function of temperature, ambipolar conductivity, chemical driving force, which is the gradient in practice of CO2 across the membrane. And then you have terms of conductivity, which are important for the ambipolar conductivity of these membranes. And you have the conductivity of solid oxide phase, and you have the volume fraction of solid oxide phase, and you also have the volume fraction of the molten carbonate phase and the conductivity of molten carbonate phase, and they are all combined in the so-called ambipolar conductivity, but where here we are already emphasizing the fact that these uh, phases are present in a, a, a certain percentage of the total volume of the membrane. Then we have another parameter which is important in performance, which is the thickness of the membrane. So the, the current is going to increase the thinner the membrane, as it was yesterday for the partial oxidation. So you can do really too much. You can play with the temperature, but not too much. You can play a little bit with chemical driving force, but not, not too much. You can really do something with the materials, choosing the right materials, and you can do a little bit with engineering and trying to have your membrane with a small thickness as small as possible. Now, yesterday you saw similar diagrams. I'm very fond of these diagrams. 
And the, as you, you might find here in, in the title of this slide, you say you see something which is Evans type diagram. So for, for people familiar with corrosion, you know what is the Evans type diagram. We just plot in the vertical axis the, the, the uh, cathodic and the anodic voltages. So we have a cathode and we have one anode. And then we just identify what is the corrosion current using the slopes that we create in this diagram, in that case, which have to do with tough and plot and things like that. So I, I've uh, introduced a few years ago a similar type of diagrams for these membranes, which uh, allow us to plot in a vertical axis the cell voltages, and you have the molten carbonate cell voltage, and you have the solid oxide cell voltage, and then you can have a look what is your current density. This is uh, uh, the ideal performance, this will be the operating point. Uh, you can estimate this ideal performance if you know what are the properties of your solid oxide and the properties of your molten phase. And then you can compare the performance, which is the ideal performance that you would expect with the real results that you are going to get. So if you get a lower value, this might mean that you have a poor grain percolation. This means that there is a constriction resistance in between the grains of your uh, uh, solid oxide skeleton. And if you have a uh, 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 poor tortuosity, which means that the, the pores between the, the, the ceramic grains offer you a very sinuous uh, uh, pathway, then you also have to pay a bill for this. Uh, the concept of tortuosity uh, was introduced so, so many years ago. And it's very useful because it tells you that the tortuosity is the ratio between the theoretical conductivity that you should have in a material fully dense without any kind of geometrical constraints or microstructural constraints. So the ratio of this theoretical conductivity and the real conductivity. So uh, for a material with a, a tortuosity, let's put it this way, the tortuosity factor will be always a number higher than one. And uh, your engineering uh, of the system will try to bring you as close to one as possible. And this means that you have to play a lot with the microstructure of the oxide phase, namely, because the molten carbonates will occupy the pores in between the, the oxide grains. So this is really a, a crucial aspect. And you can have a look at these diagrams and you obtain lots of information about the kind of constraints that you can have. If it's just a matter of microstructure, or if you also have uh, slow surface reactions, which means that you can be even more displaced from the, the what you would expect as a performance for your uh, tortuosity of the two phases that you are using. It takes a little time to go deeper with these diagrams as we have to talk about other things. So I'm going to skip so anyone interested, we can come back to this issue later. So, we talked about ambipolar conductivity. It's something which is not familiar to everyone. Uh, I, I have uh, decided to introduce here a diagram just to show you the difference between ambipolar conductivity and total conductivity in these systems. So uh, for the total conductivity, you can say that the total conductivity is a kind of a weighted sum, a weighted addition of the percentage, the volume percentage of each phase multiplied by the conductivity of each phase. And this means roughly, since uh, you have in this plot uh, a function of the oxide phase content, so this would be 100% of the oxide, and uh, somewhere all over here to the left of our diagram, we move to the condition where we would have only molten carbonates. So as the molten carbonates have a higher conductivity than the oxide, this means that the more oxide, the lower the total conductivity. The lower the oxide content, the higher the total conductivity. And if you are trying to build a fuel cell, this is really what you want. And you try to decrease the amount of oxide and you want to have maximum amount of molten phase. But for the ambipolar, which has a totally different expression, you can see that there is a relevant here, a relevant uh, effect due to the, the oxide phase uh, or the molten carbonate phase volume percentage. And so this means that you have a kind of a peak, an ideal value, which is the maximum of your ambipolar conductivity. And as you can see, for typical materials, this diagram was established for a mixture of a, a gadolinium dopsia and a, a, a mixture of sodium and lithium carbonates. 
you have a peak which is around 85% of the oxide phase. So this tells you a little bit that you should not operate with a very low oxide phase content in these materials, and you should uh, probably also avoid anything like 90%. With 90%, you might have already closed pores, and part of the molten carbonates are not going to be active. So we keep as a guidance that we should play around the 80%, let's put 70, 80%, of the uh, volume percentage of the, the, the oxide phase to have ideal ambipolar conductivity in our materials. So this is a, a, a remark on the kind of materials that we are trying to play with. Then we have this problem. We, we have a skeleton, we have a ceramic skeleton, and here I, I'm showing you in this scheme three, three types of microstructures. One with grains which are poorly connected to each other. So this is the oxide phase. The grains have almost just tiny contacts in between them. And this means that this will be the, 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 the contact in between grains will be a constriction resistance to the pathway of a, or to the movement of oxide ions. So this will be a dead microstructure. Then if we uh, can do a lot better with our ceramic processing route, then we might have grains with much better bonding in between them. And that's nice because then we don't have such huge constriction resistances. But nevertheless, we still have here our grain boundaries and everybody playing with oxide ion conductors, ceramic oxide ion conductors, knows that grain boundaries are blocking with respect to ions. And if we are really skillful, we can try to build a skeleton where the ceramic phase and the, the, the molten carbonates are aligned as tubes inside the microstructure. And then you, you have the minimum tortuosity, as you see in the upper side, because the pathway for ions will be a straight pathway. I must say this is not a, 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 an easy task, but some people are trying to do this using things like laser drilling and things like that, just to drill the holes where you are going to uh, use your molten carbonates and feed uh, with your molten carbonates. Now, the critical issue is that in most cases, you have a very complex microstructure and you want to understand how can you measure and characterize properly this microstructure and how to benchmark once again what is a good microstructure or not so good microstructure. Now, in the following minutes, I'm going to show you some experimental results that we had throughout the years with different materials. So don't lose too much time to pick all the details because this is a lot of information. I will just try to go for the highlights. All these materials were based on galenia doped ceria and the mixture of sodium and lithium carbonates, as we call it NLC. So the galenia doped ceria, we call it CGO as a kind of a nickname or a chronic. Then we had three different types of processing routes. One, kind of shake and bake, one step. We just mix everything, we just fire together, and we get interesting materials. The, the, the other two routes, we have two steps. Firstly, we prepare a porous backbone. So we have the porous ceramic, and then we do the infiltration of the ceramic with the molten carbonates. And we could use tailored powders, which means that we use a, a, a coarsening of the, the ceramic powder to obtain a certain type of porosity. And we got a, a series of pellets with different characteristics. And we also have used a, a, a good uh, sintering admixture for these materials, which is cobalt oxide. And uh, so some of the, the skeletons, the ceramic skeletons were prepared using these, these materials. So overall, we have here something like seven different materials, three different processing routes. And as I told you, You'll forget what is the meaning of all these acronyms, but no problem. Uh, we just want to keep the highlights, and I will emphasize a little bit on this. Then we just did the, the general characterization by impedance spectroscopy and uh, 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 scanning electron microscopy. To give you a little bit the picture of what you get with these materials using the one-step route, so this is the composite. You see the, the light gray oxide grains, and these are the pools of the molten carbonates. This is very beautiful, these microstructures, because the molten carbonates can easily be removed from the composite using a mild acid attack. And then you see the ceramic skeleton. Look, the beautiful ceramic skeleton 
with the, the, the grains just bonded to each other. This shows you a little bit what is the kind of materials that we are dealing with. Then we went to impedance spectroscopy for the characterization of these materials. I've shown this graph yesterday just to recall you that usually we can distinguish arcs at different frequencies and these arcs will give us some information about what is going on inside the material. And if you look at the impedance spectroscopy when we use these materials with different oxide contents, so 70 CGO means 70 volume percent, 80 CGO, 80 volume percent, 90 CGO, 90 volume percent, the impedance spectra that we obtain at a reasonably low temperature, 250 centigrades, shows this kind of arcs, uh, which are not well defined. If we magnify this high frequency region, we can really see that there is some bending in these arcs. And this is an important feature, because this means that we have here uh, a, what we might call the fingerprint of a high frequency process, and also the fingerprint of an intermediate frequency process. And this is all we need. Remember these two circles showing you that we have here two different processes with two different relaxation frequencies. Now I'm getting to a different processing route. Now we have here the porous skeleton before impregnation. Then we just do the impregnation with the molten carbonates. And you can see by, by EDS mapping that the green uh, area is the molten carbonates, and it's in between all these pores that we have in the ceramic phase. If we have a slightly different porous skeleton, we see a distribution of the phases different, and this is the, the second kind of processing route that we have used. And when we go for impedance spectroscopy, now we are, the arcs are much more visible, the, the microstructure is totally different. You can see that we have a spectra for the skeleton, which are the field symbols, and we have the spectra for the composite, which are the open symbols. And at high frequency and the intermediate frequency, they, they show roughly the same trends, which is an interesting feature. And this is true for two types of uh, microstructures that I just showed you before. And again, we have here the two circles, just to highlight that we have here two uh, different uh, arcs and two different relaxation frequencies in the electrical response of these materials. And then we have the materials prepared with a little bit of cobalt as sintering it. And again, you see the same type of microstructures, the skeleton only, the material after impregnation with the oxide phase and the molten phase around. And we go for impedance spectroscopy. And again, uh, we are closer to what we saw in the first case. So it's a very tiny high frequency arc and a much larger intermediate frequency arc. And altogether, what I wanted to uh, bring was to, to this slide here, where I just summarized what we saw previously for three different processing routes, three different microstructures. In all these microstructures, in all these materials, we can identify with some attention at low temperature, we can see that there is a high frequency arc and there is an intermediate frequency arc. And this is really a fingerprint of the microstructure of the materials. And I'm going to try to explain you now why. So we have tried to prepare what we call an equivalent circuit for these materials. Since we have an oxide phase and we have a carbonate phase, the molten carbonate phase, the most obvious uh, uh, equivalent circuit for these materials would be to consider the bulk contribution of the, of the uh, oxide phase and an intermediate frequency contribution, which has to do with grain boundaries, but also to the fact that you don't have a fully dense uh, microstructure. So you, you have, from the, the ceramic point of view, you have a porous ceramic. So this means that you don't have really a grain boundary arc, but you have an intermediate frequency arc, which will give you some information about these microstructural features. For the carbonates which are molten, you only have a resistor and a constant phase element to describe the performance of this arc. The, the interesting thing is that if you plot the conductivities of these materials, the oxide and the, the carbonates as a function of temperature in the so-called radius type plots, you realize that at low temperature, which is this range, the oxide is the best conducting phase and the carbonates have a much lower conductivity. Then you reach the eutectic temperature of the carbonates, and this means that you have a phase transition. They move from solid to molten, okay? 
And so the conductivity goes very quickly to a very high value. And then when you arrive here, the, the conductivity of the carbonate will have a lower activation energy than the oxide. So when we are doing impedance spectroscopy at low temperature, we are down here. The oxide is the best conducting phase. When we are operating the membrane, we are here in this range. So we are above the eutectic temperature. And so the molten carbonates are the best conducting uh, phase. So this means that at low temperature, you can simplify this circuit. And really what you are seeing in the impedance spectra at low temperature is just the, the response, the electrical response of the oxide phase. So you get lots of information about the oxide phase doing impedance spectroscopy at low temperature. Now, when you move to the high temperature region, which is this one, now it's the carbonates which are the best conductors. And what you are going to see roughly is the resistance of the carbonate phase. And you don't see the oxide. We have a parallel association, so you always see just the best conductor. So this is very useful because this allows you to estimate what is your resistance of the oxide phase and what is your resistance of the carbonates. And you can plot this and do radius plots like these ones. And I'm just using these radius plots to show you how difficult it is a decision using this type of traditional plots to make a decision on what is your best material. So I have here six of these uh, uh, membranes that we just saw before, plus the pure phase, in this case, CGL for the backbone. And for the composite, I have the same six compositions that we had before, plus the uh, molten carbonates, which are up here. And just looking at all these lines that you have here, and the, the colors are preserving between the two, the two plots, you see, it's not very easy to decide what is your really good uh, uh, microstructure in this case. So this is just to show you that when we are dealing with total conductivity, the information is really confusing and you can hardly make a decision on what is your best material. So what is the solution? Again, we try to use specific diagrams to plot what is the performance of these materials. And we use two concepts which are also very well established in the literature of uh, uh, solid state ionics or solid state electrochemistry, which is the concept of ionic transport number, in this case of the solid oxide and the ionic transport number of the molten carbonates. And by definition, they are simply the ratio of the uh, molten carbonates resistance divided by the total resistance and for the molten carbonates the ratio of the solid oxide resistance divided by the total resistance. So remember that you could use impedance spectroscopy exactly to estimate these resistances. So this means that you can create a plot like this one where you have your ionic transport number in this case of the molten carbonate phase. You can estimate your ambipolar conductivity just based, for instance, on the knowledge that you have from the properties of your pure phases. And this is a kind of a target value. And then you can see how you are with your materials with respect to model behavior. So uh, the, the, the slopes of these lines that we have here have a physical meaning. One of them is the, the symmetric of the resistance of the molten carbonate phase. The other one is the slope corresponds to the resistance of the solid oxide phase. Again, these diagrams, to, to discuss them in detail, we would need a bit more time. But just to show you that there is a diagram very similar to others that I've introduced before that can give us a, an answer to what is the best material. So when I showed you before the Arrhenius type plots, we had this kind of messy situation. When we move to these diagrams, the situation is really beautiful and clear. I want the best ambipolar conductivity. I have here my membranes. I have here my model. This is what I would expect uh, if uh, my microstructures were perfect. And I have here exactly where my membranes stay. So I can see immediately that these two membranes are the best membranes because they give me the best, the closest approach to the uh, uh, ideal ambipolar conductivity, although they don't get there. And these two or three, they, they have a much poor performance. So these kinds of plots are extremely useful to decide if you have a good microstructure. And you can build these plots just using impedance spectroscopy, which is a very simple tool. 
So this is a good portrait of your electrical microstructure of your composite materials. And then you can uh, immediately also realize that depending on the position of these working points that you have here, that your problem might be tortuosity of the oxide phase or the tortuosity of the molten carbonate phase and try to improve the microstructure. You don't have to go for permeation, which are very difficult experiments. And just to show you the kind of experiment that you have to do for permeation, this is a typical cell. In fact, this is a cell that is used by a, a group that uh, uh, is working closely with us from the University of Newcastle. And roughly we have a chamber, uh, a closed chamber. We have an aluminum tube and we have our pellet or our membrane in the top of this tube. So this is sealed here. And then we have a, a gas flowing inside this chamber and we have another gas flowing outside the chamber. So one of the gases is the so-called feed side. The other gas is the permeate side. So what we have to do is to analyze exactly what is the CO2 content in one gas and the CO2 content in the other gas. And we know exactly how much CO2 is being permeating, is permeating across the membrane. Again, as we are doing experiments at high temperature or at reasonably high temperature, this means that sealing is very tricky. And as the molten carbonates are very corrosive from a chemical point of view, finding a good seal is very tricky. So you only want to do permeation experiments when you really know that you have a good microstructure and you have a really uh, interesting uh, membrane. This is the kind of results that you get in your permeation measurements. Uh, just to show you, if you remember a kind of a guidance number yesterday for the partial oxidation of methane, uh, people are trying to reach a minimum of one milliliter per minute per square centimeter. So here there is a minus missing. And for, for these membranes, we are not far away from there. So depending exactly on the working temperature and the content of CO2 in the feed side, we can reach values of 0.5 milliliters per minute per square centimeter. Although for lower uh, uh, contents and lower temperatures, we are down here, 0 0.2, 0 0.25 roughly, which are interesting numbers uh, still able to be optimized. And the solution obviously is to look for better oxides, thinner layers, or better microstructures in general. So, uh, the values that I've shown you before were obtained in, in our lab in cooperation with this group from Newcastle. And uh, here I have a, a short table just to tell you that these are amongst the best values that you can see. The units here are different. Uh, uh, different authors prefer different types of units. But just to show you that the values that we were obtaining were amongst the best that are obtained uh, elsewhere. So the, this is a, an interesting result. Now, we can again build diagrams like uh, I, I've shown you before, uh, where we just plot the, the thermodynamic voltage of the molten carbonates in the solid oxide phase and see how our membrane is. But it's those membranes that I've shown you, we should have this ideal performance. So we should be uh, with a current in the membrane somewhere over here. And we realized that we were not there. And so we could estimate the pore tortuosity, and the pore tortuosity told us that the tortuosity of the molten carbonate phase was 2.6, or around 2.6. So there is a lot to do to improve this microstructure. For the grains, there was a problem also with grain per percolation. Tortuosity was about 1.5. So ideally, we should have a better result. So this, again, is a good guidance on what we can get uh, uh, of information to see what, what are the, the bottlenecks in our microstructures in these membranes. Now, we have performed some endurance tests at 850, which is a very demanding temperature. As you can see, there is a slight decline throughout the time. And we did some uh, uh, micro microscopy on these membranes. And the, the solution is uh, you cannot do the same membrane in the microscope before and after because you have to to flood the membrane with the molten carbonates and use it and it's dead. So we use twin membranes. This means that we prepare two membranes at the same time under the same conditions. And then we analyze one that went uh, through the endurance test and the other one that uh, has not suffered anything. And you can see that the membrane that has not suffered anything, the skeleton is reasonably open. But the membrane that stayed for over 100 hours operating, the skeleton started sintering. And this is normal because we have a molten phase 
and molten phases act usually as a, a sintrig add uh, agent. So ceramics usually tend to sinter when they are in the presence of a molten phase because the molten phase is going to facilitate the transport of the cations which is needed to proceed with the sintering process. And we could just go for impedance spectroscopy and we could realize that it's really in the porosity and the interfacial region that we have, we can see very large changes by, by impedance spectroscopy. Okay. Uh, we are getting closer to the uh, end of my time, and uh, it's a moment to speak a little bit about the future. So, new membranes, new materials. I've been talking to you about this membrane for CO2 separation. There is also very little, but already one or two cases of activity on membrane for NOx separation. And you can see in this table what we are talking about. For CO2 separation, we have usually a salt, which is a, 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 an alkali metal carbonate. We have a solid oxide, and the, the reactions that we have are described somewhere here uh, uh, as a permeate side surface reaction. The other one is the reciprocal of this one. And the ions involved in the operation of these membranes are the carbonate ions and the oxide ions. I, I, I would like to make just a, a short comment because I said nothing about this. There is some discussion and some interesting discussion on the role of the alkali metal ions because the alkali metal ions can perform exactly the same role as the carbonate ions. And there is some evidence from some literature data that the alkali metal ions probably play a role larger than usually is said in the literature. So, uh, however, as a schematic, we usually uh, speak about the, the carbonate ions, because that's the net flux that we obtain in the end, is the flux of carbonate ions. Now, when we move for the CO2, from the CO2 separation membranes to the NOx separation membranes, we also have a mixture of salts, usually eutetic mixtures again of salts, and you can see nitrites, nitrites, nitrates and nitrite, nitrite nitrites and nitrates, and uh, you can have different types of solids involved. If you have a mixed ionic and electronic conductor, you only need the two phases, the molten phase and your ceramic phase. But if you want to use a solid oxide phase, as we are doing in the, in the case of the CO2 separation membranes, you also need an electronic conducting phase, which are these gray uh, uh, spheres that you see throughout. What, what is the reason for this? is that in this membrane for NOx, you also need some electronic transport inside the membrane. So the charge carriers are the NOx, let's say, minus ions are the oxide ions and also the electrons. And you can operate these membranes roughly in the very same manner as you can operate the membranes for CO2 separation. So they are similar in concept. The real tricky thing is that you need some electronic conduction in this uh, in these systems, and you can do it either using a mixed ionic and electronic conductor as ceramic, or using still a solid oxide, but then you need an electronic conductor to provide the best way for electrons. So this is really an interesting solution and develop for this kind of membranes. What else can we do? We can choose the best systems for, for as salts, and you can see here, for instance, the system that we have used more often in our body is this one, the lithium sodium uh, uh, carbonate system. And you have a eutetic point of 500 centigrade, which is interesting. But if you move for the system which has potassium, lithium, and sodium, you can lower this eutetic to about 400 centigrade, which is really interesting. And we are working a little bit on this. And if you move for nitrates, then it's almost a kind of a dream because you can have, for instance, in this case, you have sodium lithium nitrates and eutetic moves to 190 approximately. So this means that you have a molten phase at very, very low temperature. These molten phases are used in many uh, energy uh, solutions. You can see that the, the, I'm using here a, a, a phase diagram, let's put it this way, from a, a journal on solar energy materials. So th this is a, a, a widely used liquid, let's say, for a, a, a variety of applications. So we can change the nitrates, we can change the carbonates, and we have a wide range of options that we can use 
to change the molten phase. With respect to the oxide ion conductors, the situation is a bit more complex. I have here a kind of a classical Arrhenius type diagrams with the conductivities of these materials as a function of the temperature. And you can see several families which are well known uh, of these materials. And so the conductivity, the best conducting phases are the bismuth based phases, okay? Uh, in this case, this is the so-called Bikovox. So it's a bismuth vanadium copper oxide, which has a very nice conductivity, very high conductivity. Uh, what we are using at present is this Syria Gadolinia, so uh, Gadolinia doped Syria, which is not bad at high temperature, but it's much inferior at, at low temperature. This yellow area here identifies the working temperature that we want for our CO2 separation membranes. So here the bismuth-based materials are much better than the Syria-based materials. And all the other electrolytes that we know, uh, epatites, the lanthanum silicates here, or these uh, uh, calcium titanates, or the conventional uh, yttria stabilized zirconia, they are all much worse than the, the bismuth phase. So we have the bismuth, then we have Syria, and then we have the others to a certain extent. So in the working range that we really want. So it would be a dream if we could go from, from Syria to bismuth, because I told you before, that the rate determining step in these membranes is usually the oxide ion conductivity, which is much lower than the molten carbonate's conductivity. So going to bismuth is really something higher. And you can use your model that I presented in the beginning of this, uh, of this talk. And uh, again, I have here the, the cell voltage, the current in the cell, and this is a kind of prediction of the results that you could have with three different types of electrolytes. Yttria stabilized zirconia, very small currents because it's a reasonably poor oxide ion conductor at this temperature. CGO, which is what we are doing, uh, not so bad. But if we could go for bismuth, and this is bismuth ytterbium, uh, you can pick literature data and you can see that you could have a kind of almost 100% improvement in the performance of your membrane. So going to bismuth would be a very, very nice uh, solution. And obviously we try to do it. And I'm showing you very recent results published by the end of uh, uh, last year, where we try to use uh, yttrium dope bismuth, which is also an interesting uh, oxide with very good uh, ionic conductivity. And the problems that we have with these materials, you can see them very easily here. If we test these membranes at 450 centigrades, which we can do because when we use the ternary eutetic system, the melting point is 400 centigrade. So we are a little bit above uh, the, the eutetic temperature. So we can operate the membranes here. So for one hour, everything is okay. But with one and hours operation, the bismuth phase is decomposing, 550, even worse. So it's really a problem to try to use these phases. On the contrary, if you use these materials with the, the mixture of nitrates that we are using, which is in this case, the potassium and sodium nitrates, you can really operate the membranes at 450 up to 100 hours without many problems. And even at 550 short operation, you, you can do it. So, there is a room where you can use these bismuth-based uh, uh, materials with the nitrates, a little bit more tricky with the carbonates. So the bismuth ytterbium that I've shown you before, uh, a little bit better. We could operate this material at 450 with the, the molten carbonates, 450, 100 hours, no structural changes, nothing special appearing. At 500, it's already a problem. And with the nitrates, it, it, beautiful, no, no changes at all in the, the characteristics of the membrane. So you could preserve uh, the material. So this is really our present activity to try to use these bismuth-based phases to test them as uh, membranes. Another solution uh, that we discussed yesterday, and uh, it's also useful for these membranes, is the so-called supported membranes. So what we are doing is to have a, a porous support, which is in this case a skeleton of CGO, highly porous. Then we use a thinner membrane, a thinner, a thinner layer uh, uh, with the same CGO, but with a, a slightly smaller porosity to uh, support uh, a, a very thin layer 
of uh, our composite membrane. And you can see CGO and LC7030. This means 70% of the oxide phase, 30% of the molten phase. And you see from the scale here that we are talking about membranes, which are about 15 micrometer thickness. So other, other photos of the very same kind of uh, uh, systems we are studying nowadays, the upper layer, the support, and you can see the upper layer is fully dense. Uh, and the support uh, to a certain extent is flooded by some of the carbonates which are coming from the upper layer, but this is a reasonably small extent in depth. So we have mostly a very thin upper layer with the membrane. And this, we hope, will allow us to decrease the membrane thickness by a factor of 10 and obviously increase the CO2 separation or the CO2 permeation of these membranes. We are already doing a little bit of a, a endurance of these membranes. We also have tests already performed at 650 for 100 hours, and the stability is quite good, as you can see. Uh, uh, these are very recent results, so that they are not yet published. So just to show you that we are really uh, interested in these systems and doing uh, 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 experiments uh, at present on, on these systems. OK, I'm getting really close to the end of my time, so I think it's a good moment to uh, try to draw some conclusions. Uh, impedance spectroscopy can be used to inspect the electrical microstructure of oxide salt composites. Uh, I, I, I emphasize this as an important conclusion because, as I told you, we have the issue of electrical microstructure of these composites. We must know lots of things about how they are supposed to behave. And, uh, uh, scanning electron microscopy is not enough for that because when we are dealing with these materials, the electrical response, you cannot just guess the electrical response from the kind of information that you get with microscopy. So you must really do electrical measurements. And impedance spectroscopy is very, very uh, simple, and it's very effective in providing you important information because we have the advantage that that low temperature and that high temperature, oxide and salt, change relatively their, their orders of magnitude of conductivity. And so at low temperature, you see the oxide. At high temperature, you see the salt. And this is very, very important to guess a little bit how your composite membrane is going to, to operate. Then we need a way to benchmark and see what, what is really the kind of performance that we have against theoretical, against other membranes. And uh, we have develop, developed, and I've introduced to you, a series of diagrams. They are all derived one from the others. So, uh, uh, some diagrams, you use them directly to the, to the material. And in others, you can plot the values for, for permeation or separation of your gas, so flow rates. But they are somehow interrelated. And you can get lots of information about the kinetics that you have in this system. So uh, the, the state of the art is that the results are below ideal performance, but we are still far away from optimized membranes. As I told you, we are doing a lot in the field of new oxides. We are also changing the salts, and uh, we, we have very interesting results, which are being, some of them recently published and others under preparation. At last, uh, we, we usually don't think too much about what is the possible role of some composite materials. But in these composite materials, when we combine ionic and even electronic flows, we, we can have very interesting functionalities that we cannot have from any other single phase material. And this is really an interesting development that I would uh, like to, to, to emphasize for people that might be willing to do in the future any work in this direction. Lastly. Uh, some, some reference to, uh, I, I had throughout the years quite a number of people working with me in Aveil. So I have here just some of their names. These are all postdocs, Atul Jamal from India, Jean Grill from, from Brazil, actually, Maxim Starikevich from, from Belarus, Flip, Sonia, uh, Anna Rondão, and uh, Natercia, they, they are all Portuguese. Uh, then we have a very close cooperation with, with the, the group of uh, Professor Ian Metcalf at, at the University of Newcastle in the UK. He was doing uh, our first CO2 permeation experiment. So they, 
we were sending them the, the, the membranes and they were doing their very, very good setups to do it. Now we can do them already in uh, clay, so the, the situation has improved. And I had also in recent years a very interesting uh, cooperation uh, with uh, IPEN in Brazil, the group of uh, Ginald and uh, Liana Mosilo, uh, where the, they have, uh, as you know, developed the flash sintering uh, preparation of these membranes using flash sintering. And uh, I think yesterday morning you had a presentation by one of the persons from, from this group. So, uh, you, you know more details because I had no chance to see the presentation, but nevertheless, this was part of our uh, cooperation. So the funding is uh, by, by far, it's mostly uh, Portuguese funding, uh, different projects, but this is a European project uh, with people from Norway and people from, from uh, Poland. Uh, and uh, also obviously some reference to a uh, 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 Long stay I had in, in Brazil a few years ago with a special invited researcher exactly at IPEN Sao Paulo with, with the, the Mosilo group. So I finished my time. I think it's a good moment to stop uh, my presentation and be open for questions. I hope we have more questions today than we had yesterday. So I will stop now sharing and we just move to see your faces. Thank you very much, Professor, for this excellent lecture. So you are open for questions. So I can see that 56 people survived from yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> survived but lost their mouth. You can also write your, your question here the chat and the chat panel and we can we can translate for professor or you can ask for professor professor you have here uh, a question uh, from sabrina sabrina hello professor looking looking to the unit transport number diagrams uh -huh. how can we determine if you if we should change the tortuosity or other aspect of the membrane to improve the efficiency okay uh, just a, 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 a short comment because we have another comment here that you can, you can make your questions in English or Portuguese. Uh, uh, my my Portuguese is not that bad, has no Brazilian <laughs> accent, but it's good enough to understand usually uh, Brazilian people. So you you don't have to be concerned with my my Portuguese. I think it's good enough to to pick whatever you want. So I'll try now to to go to the question that Sabrina raised. And uh, I hope you are seeing again the slides. I will move very quickly to the slide, which is interesting to answer uh, Serena. Let me see. Yeah, here we are. So uh, the, the answer to, to the question that Serena uh, raised is, is somewhere over here. So we can build this slide or these diagrams using the resistance that we have from the molten carbonate and solid oxide that we take from experiments, like impedance spectroscopy, okay? And this gives us, for instance, an experimental point, and we are here. But we can also estimate the values that we could have from a theoretical point of view, because we know the theoretical conductivity of the molten carbonates, and we know the theoretical conductivity of the solid oxide phase, if they, are, they were fully dense, or if they have, as they have, only a certain volume fraction. And uh, uh, the only thing we have to do is to multiply the conductivity of the forest here, in this, in this case, where we have the conductivity of the solid oxide and the conductivity of the molten carbonates. The only thing we have to do is to multiply the conductivity of the solid oxide phase uh, pure dense, and we multiply this by the volume fraction of the solid oxide phase, phase and, and we have the estimated conductivity of our porous skeleton. For the molten carbonates, we multiply the volume fraction of the molten carbonates by the, let's say, theoretical conductivity or established literature conductivity of the molten carbonates, and we should have, we this estimate the values for the conductivity of the molten carbonates as only a small fraction of the total volume of your membrane. 
So you can very easily have your experimental values and you also can have theoretical values that you can estimate using data on the conductivity of your materials. And this means that you are going to have your experimental point and you are going to have somewhere over here, your phrase over here, you, you are going to have your ideal point, which is based on literature data and the volume fractions that you have from your materials. And so from the position that you have between your real point and your ideal point, you can realize what, what of these lines is really deviating from ideal conditions. And if the slope of the lines is increasing in some manner, this means that you have a torque positive factor, which is very high. If the slope of the lines is the same as the theoretical one, that means that that phase has a very good microstructure and you don't have to be concerned about it. Okay, so uh, I, I, I could spend a lot more time talking about this, but uh, uh, I think it's something that we can also discuss afterwards privately or by exchange of mails because there are some delicate aspects here which probably are not so easy to pick in, in an oral presentation. You, you probably have to go step by step because you have to, to deal with different concepts and different things at the same time. But it, it, it's, it's really simple. If you know the literature data, if you know the data that you have from impedance spectroscopy, you can jump from one side to another and you can have all these spots very, very easily. So I hope I could answer Sabrina. Otherwise, well, I will be glad question. to. Uh, I'll be glad also to to answer by email if she wants to send me uh, uh, an email with uh, further questions or if something is not clear. Thank you, Professor. We have another questions. Uh, we have a question uh, from Professor Fabio and a question from Professor Jeff Miller. Uh, Professor Fabio, please your first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fernando, for your presentation. Ah, I have two questions that I would like to ask you. First of all, if instead of have a pure CO2 stream, if we have a gas mixture, how would that change our driving force for these reactions? Okay. It's... It, it, uh, it... You want me to answer one by one, or you ask the two and then? Uh... Well, the second one is more or less like what happens with the positive ion? Okay, good. Very interesting question. So let's start with the first one. Imagine that you have CO2 and uh, you have oxygen as well. That's already accounted in the model because we have. Uh, 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 an expression that takes into consideration the CO2 activity and the oxygen activity. But with the fuel, very likely you have water vapor. Then the system gets more complex because with water vapor, this is not accounted in this model. And water vapor is going to participate in chemical equilibriums with the molten phase. And you are not going to have just molten carbonates, but you are also going to have molten hydroxide. And so you are going to displace the characteristics of the membrane. In general, and there are some experiments done here, mostly in, in Norway by the group of Truls Norby and uh, people from Sintef, Marilor Fontaine and other people. In general, when you have water vapor, you increase the CO2 separation rate because instead of having just the oxide ions that can travel to balance your carbonate ions, you, you can have also the OH minus ions, which are also part of the, the, of the transport pr process. Uh, you have a price. You don't have exactly the same selectivity. So you, you, you might end up with CO2 plus a little bit of something because you have more ions involved. So in general, you can account uh, uh, on all these things from a, even a theoretical point of view, but the system gets really very complex because you are not dealing already only with the molten carbonate phase or whatever. So under typical conditions, uh, I would say that most of these membranes will be operating quite close to a pure molten carbonate. What, what this means is that you must go to extreme, really extreme conditions to deviate the molten phase 
from molten carbonates to molten hydroxides, for instance. It would have to be a, a, a huge uh, 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 exposure just to water vapor and no CO2. As long as you have a little bit of CO2 and you know it from the molten carbonate fuel cells, the molten carbonates can operate for many, many hours as long as you have CO2. And so if the membrane is for CO2 separation, that's safe. So, so from a real point of view, you have a few more problems because you have more ions and more chemical equilibrium, which is involved in the operation of the membrane. But from a realistic point of view, it's not so bad because molten carbonates will tend to dominate as molten salt. And so the performance will be uh, roughly like that. So the second question, what is the role of the alkali uh, metal ions? That's very interesting because there is really a debate in the literature. If you read anything about molten carbonate fuel cells, everybody will tell you the carbonate ions, the carbonate ions, the carbonate ions. Nobody will tell you anything about al alkali metal ions. But if you go to the old literature data, and I mean things from the 60s, huh? uh, last century, so published in very good journals like the Journal of the Electrochemical Society, and those papers that you can really rely on what's written, Okay, and uh, those people, they did some measurements of diffusion coefficients of the alkali metals and the carbonates uh, using uh, isotopes and things like that. And they came to the conclusion that under some circumstances, the diffusion coefficients of the alkali metal cations were higher than the carbonate ions. And this would point to the fact that the, the, the charge carrier is not the carbonate, but would be the alkali metal ion. And then we have this kind of puzzling. So if the alkali metal is the charge carrier, why is it that we are having transport of carbonate? Because we have a molten phase and the alkali metals are going in one direction and the molecules, let's put the molecules of the, the carbonate, the alkali carbonate are, are, are just flowing in the other direction. Otherwise you would have a buildup of alkali metal ions in one side of the membrane and you would have a depletion in the other side of the membrane. But this is not the case because really you have a molten phase. So from a net point of view, you can speak about carbonate ions. From a scientific point of view, it's very important that we, we realize that the alkali metals are not there seated just watching. They are probably uh, uh, main players in, in the game, okay? Okay, Professor Fernando, we have another question from, from Professor Jeff Miller. Please, Professor. So, so thank you, a very nice presentation. And I would think from your, your chemical species, your CO2 selectivity is very high, but yes. are there contaminants in the, the gases that are gonna create a problem? Like if you have hydrocarbons, you mentioned these are corrosive and you're also at very high temperature, you have oxygen in there. Is this gonna make problems? Or for the membrane long term? Okay, uh, so what I can answer you about the membranes, I don't know any tests up to now with these membranes involving also hydrocarbons, okay? Uh, okay. What people has just added to the system was water vapor, which is also a typical thing that you would expect in many flue gases. But if we think again of the molten carbonate fuel cells, which are systems very mature, very well established, you, you can run the molten carbonate fuel cells with methane, and that's not a problem. So I would expect that you could run these systems also with the presence of small amounts of hydrocarbons, and this should not be a major issue because when, when we are talking about molten carbonate fuel cells with the same operating temperatures, you can live with them for thousands of years, okay? With a slight degradation, but it's, it's not that serious. So this means that these, these these phases can survive very well as long as I said before, as long as you have CO2. Uh, there, there is a very interesting paper, I, I think it's also from the early 60s or something like that, published in the proceedings of the, the Electrochemical Society. And uh, uh, some people in the US, I can't remember what was the, the lab, they just try to identify what was the minimum amount of CO2 that you needed in the gas phase to keep, let's say, the carbonates alive without being decomposed. And it was ridiculously small, like 1% or something like that. So if you have 
if you have a, a membrane for CO2 separation, you expect to have a lot more CO2 around, and so you should expect to have no problem. So tests with these membranes with the hydrocarbons, up to now I don't know of any test, but by analogy with the molten carbonates, which are similar systems in all aspects, they survive for many years without any problem. So I would expect they will survive. So I have a, a brief second comment. So, so I know there are mem polymer membranes for CO2 separation, you know, low temperature things. Is it, if, are you considering some sort of scheme where you, you take lower concentrations with polymers and separate, you know, grossly separate CO2 to get to these higher concentrations? Your flux was a little on the low side, so concentrations make a lot of difference. Is there a pre-concentration sort of thing that mm -hmm. might be useful at low temperature or, or not? At, at present, I would say that both systems are being developed looking at uh, with totally different targets. They are not considered as a kind of combined systems or whatever. So uh, a few comments. Most of the membranes for low temperature, to my knowledge, they are not as selective as, as these ones, oh, exactly sure. because yeah. you see, because you are dealing with absorption or absorption or uh, 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 even uh, uh, what you would, you would call a molecular sieve or whatever. And when we touch these things, we, we don't have the same selectivity as in ionic materials. That was a little bit the beginning of my talk yesterday. When you have these systems, you, you have a very good selectivity. So, but nevertheless, the membranes that I've talked about, they are just interesting if you have a high temperature uh, gas uh, uh, flow. Uh, if you are looking for something for low temperature, then you have to go for polymers or you have to go to other alternatives. So I, I believe these systems will be interesting for different target applications. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, you might even get to the conclusion at some point that they might complement and you can think of a combined system where you get this kind of concentration effect and things like that. But for time being, I would say they, they are just being conceived for totally different uh, uh, range of applications. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so now we can, uh, Professor, thank you very much for, 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 for your answers. Uh, uh, I'd like to, to, thank you, Professor. I, I would like to invite to everyone to, to open your, your camera we intend to, to take a, a, a group picture from our workshop. Please, everyone, open your, your camera. Great, great. Very nice. Smile. Probably we will be able to share this picture with the audience after the end of the workshop. I can see quite a few familiar faces in between those listening. Yes. So. Have you got it, Marcelo? Everything okay? Okay, so thank you. Uh, we are going to a cough break and you'll see you all uh, at 3 p.m. Okay. Okay. Just, just a, a, a special uh, reference to my friends in uh, IPEN. I've seen uh, Eliana, Ginalva, and Dion, uh, besides Fabio, obviously. But uh, uh, so I see they are all okay. That's good. Good. Okay. Thank you. See you in a few minutes. Okay. Enjoy your coffee. Coffee break.
Tudo bem, Professor Fernando? Fernando? Força, força, vai. Força, força. Tudo bem, Fernando? Tudo. Felizmente, por aí também, estou a ver. Tudo com é. telas sorridentes. Já vi que está tudo, tudo bem. Dentro, dentro o... dos problemas, enfim, há quem esteja a sofrer mais, como se costuma é. dizer. Tudo bem na quarentena. É isso, é isso, é isso. É isso. <risos> Nós neste momento estamos já numa fase razoavelmente boa, Pensámos por uma fase muito má há duas, três semanas, com um pico enorme de casos. Neste momento estamos com um número uh, dos mais baixos desde há seis meses. Portanto, a, a situação com, com o confinamento muito, muito... Mas parou tudo, praticamente. Escolas, tudo. Está praticamente tudo parado. A única coisa que é permitida, por exemplo, nas universidades, os estudantes de doutorado e pós-docs, etc., podem ir para os laboratórios, mas trabalham numa versão de turnos, para haver um mínimo de... de de presença, portanto, uns fazem um turno de manhã muito cedo e os outros fazem o um turno da tarde e vai até à noite para evitar o, ao máximo pessoas. E, por exemplo, na, na Universidade da Aveiro, neste momento, há cerca de uma semana, não há caso nenhum registado de, de, de Covid, o que é, obviamente, muito, muito bom. E você, você já tomou a vacina? Não, não, eu, eu estou na, na, nas prioridades portuguesas, eu estou no segundo grupo. O primeiro grupo foi profissionais de saúde, pessoas com, que estão em, em, em centros de terceira idade. Em, ainda não estou lá, eu ainda não estou lá. E, portanto, em, ainda, não tenho, ainda não tive essa prioridade. Portanto, eu estou no segundo grupo, que é um grupo acima dos 65 anos, que se prevê que deve começar em abril. Ah, bom. Portanto, neste momento a previsão é que essa vacinação deve começar em abril e com a alteração das regras de vacinação, uma vez que há algumas vacinas que parece que toleram um intervalo entre doses maior do que estava inicialmente previsto, e portanto neste momento isso foi também adotado aqui em Portugal, e isso vai permitir aumentar um pouco a taxa de vacinação, portanto, um pouco mais rápida. Portanto, eu, eu imagino que quando chegar em junho, sem querer ser demasiado otimista, que já terei as vacinas, as duas doses da vacina, é, o que não sei se será muito eficaz, porque nós sabemos que com estas mutações do vírus, etc., ninguém sabe verdadeiramente qual vai ser a resistência da vacina perante as novas realidades que vão surgindo. Mas pelo menos deverá permitir que o sistema de saúde, em geral, a nível internacional, fique mais calmo. Eu diria que não vai resolver totalmente o problema, mas eu espero que pelo menos atenue consideravelmente o problema e, portanto, fique mais calmo. Vamos ver. As notícias do Brasil, de facto, não são muito boas. Eu, eu tenho estado a acompanhar uh, também as notícias do Brasil e, e vamos ver o que isto vai dar. Mas pode ser que com a vacinação, uh, neste momento a Inglaterra com a vacinação já tem resultados muito interessantes. Portanto, toda a, 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 eram notícias ainda de hoje ou ontem, a, a, a parte de, 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 das pessoas, digamos, de maior idade, tinha caído 80% o número de hospitalizações, etc., já por virtude da vacinação. Portanto, 80% é um número impressionante, realmente. Portanto, vamos ver se a coisa é realmente melhor. Mas pronto, é, é, eu, eu vou dizer que tem sido terrível, mas felizmente para mim tem sido um pouco... Enfim, algumas limitações, como é evidente, mobilidade, etc., mas tirando isso... Uma vida descansada. De agricultor. <risos> Você está morando no sítio ou não? Sim, 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 sim. Tenho muito com que me entreter. Portanto, o meu confinamento é muito pequeno, porque aqui eu posso andar, não, não, há, não há qualquer tipo de, de... Desde logo a densidade populacional é baixíssima, não é? Portanto, eu posso andar na rua sem qualquer tipo de problema. E em segundo lugar, mesmo que eu ande só, digamos, na, na, na minha parte de, de terrenos, etc., tenho muito por onde andar, portanto, não estou, não estou fechado em casa, tenho muito com que me entreter. E como gosto de, de, deste tipo de atividades, ando a fazer um pouco de agricultura, bricolagem, pedreiro, e portanto mantenho, a minha, mantenho o meu espírito e o meu físico bastante, em bastante bom estado nestas circunstâncias. Por isso eu digo, eu não sou dos piores seguramente, estou, estou numa situação razoavelmente boa. Muito bom. E pronto, vamos ver, fazemos agora uns minutos só de pausa para ver se assistimos depois ao, ao Jeff Miller, tá? Ok. Até já. Pronto, está feito. Até já. Sim.
Vou, vou tomar, já, vou tomar qualquer coisa agora, só. Até já. Até já. Ok. Ai, não saiu. So, Jeff, your Portuguese is improving for sure after this yeah, break. Yeah, for sure, right. I understood <laughs> all of that. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, you want me to start to share? Let's uh, pull the slides up. Yeah, maybe it's a good idea, yeah. But, uh... Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. No, perfect. I got them. Hi, hello, everybody. Hi, Andrea. Hi, Fabio. Hi, Jeff. Hey, how are you? Uh, I'm fine. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I forgot yesterday. Yeah, we are very interested in. Uh, I forgot about commenting yesterday. We are very interested in. in, in Trying to do this, this if you if you could do this longer workshop uh, session of studying okay. real samples, real analysis. Uh, I was just thinking that maybe for for yeah, when people have some sample, some some uh, data, that would be good, right? I'm not sure. I mean, oh, absolutely. So what I typically do in the class is I'll go through the steps to process the data. I'll ask them all to have the software and we'll step through it and they will actually have to do the analysis on the sample, on the data that I provide. And they're, in they're intended to be simple samples so that you can make progress. And then okay. we'll take breaks throughout the day. And then as if somebody has data and they wanna look at the data and do the processing and look and see what you can learn. You know, my students, uh, when we're at the beam line, we actually process the data right there to qualitatively look and see if it's doing what we want. You know, I'm looking at reduced metal nanoparticles and if my cell leaks, I, it ruins the data. And so you only get to go back every three or four months if you're lucky. So you don't wanna go home and find out all your samples have been ruined. You wanna be sure that before you move on, the data is what you want. So it's very useful for, so we can easily sit down and look at someone else's data and say, well, you know, what do I see in the spectra and what, what can you learn from just a qualitative assessment? So, but then if we wanted to fit it more carefully, we'd have to have the references and do some of that. But certainly that's what I try to do is give you the tools and then we can start to look at real samples. Excellent, we can, we can discuss uh, for, 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 yeah, af afterwards. To schedule it for 
for a, a couple of months or and, something. And like often that, when, that, when know, because the, the number of people that are involved, sometimes the uh, weekday doesn't work. We can even do this on a Saturday if, if that's convenient. Okay. That's Excellent. often times when only students, you know, they all have classes and they all have other, other commitments. Okay, very good. Yeah, yeah. I remember you, you mentioned something about like eight hours. Yeah, we can be flexible on that. I, I, I've done this as a course. Usually I'm in the room so that if somebody has a problem, I can go over and show them what to do. I'm not sure online how long it would take, but we could even do it in a two day thing if that's you know, four hours and four hours or, or whatever is convenient. Or we can eat, there's usually what I do is I go, give you the basics. And then after the basics, then what we do is I say, look, when you start to do this for yourself, get as far as you can. And when you run into problems, let me know. And we could log today, you can now log on and do this by video and you can walk people through it. So we don't actually have to get together to, to process data anymore. So that's one positive thing about all this virus business. Yes. People learn to, to, to work remotely, right? Yeah, remotely together, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Much more fun together together, but okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> remotely together. Yeah. Well, I guess we are ready on time. So, sure, anytime you're ready. Yeah, I'd like to uh, continue this afternoon session if uh, the second lecture from Professor Jeff Miller from, from Purdue University, you keep talking about uh, uh, X-ray absorption application to, to catalysts. And uh, as you see here, I think today he will talk a little more about uh, real applications. So please, Jeff. Uh, okay, thanks. Okay, the floor so is once again, thank, thank you all for uh, jo you know, joining in. And, and once again, thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, I do thermal catalysis, which is a little different topic than you all are, have been discussing. Not, so I'm going to actually talk about what you can do with X-ray spectroscopy <clears throat> in the context of nanoparticles. And here's just a few commercial things. And the main point of this slide is, you know, you can do any element, certainly any metal element in the periodic table. And, and these things are practiced at large commercial scale. I actually, when I was in industry, use these techniques to solve real practical problems to find out things like, well, when there's phase separation or poisoning or sometimes synthesis. Uh, today, you know, with uh, the new technology that we're all trying to do and trying to develop, you certainly want to look at what are the proper structures and we're going to try to build new, new materials and new capabilities. So rather than just talk about X-ray spectroscopy in a sort of an abstract, I thought what I would do is talk about something in my own research. Let me see if I can get it to advance. There we go. Pull up a pointer. Uh, pointer. Okay, so this is a, a student of mine. I'm interested in alloys and uh, shale gas related things. So Purdue has a center called CSTAR. It's funded by our National Science Foundation. It's five universities, Purdue is the lead, but there's uh, faculty and students from Northwestern, New Mexico, Notre Dame, and Texas. So we have about, I think about 25 faculty currently and about 60 students and postdocs. <clears throat> and I'll sort of describe what our vision is about the uh, sort of the technology that we're trying to develop for the US applications. But for this talk, I'm, we're gonna try to make a new alloy of platinum, and I give, I'll give you the answer. It's a platinum three chromium ordered phase. And here's the structure. It's about a phase centered cubic ordered phase. And we're gonna do sort of a model reaction, but also a practical reaction of propane dehydrogenation. What we're trying to do is make propylene. And what we're not trying to do is once you make a little hydrogen, you add hydrogen and you can fragment carbon carbon bonds. This is called hydrogenolysis. We don't wanna do this. We don't wanna turn bigger molecules into smaller molecules. And so, you know, a good catalyst is highly selective and highly active and very stable. And if you start to do these things, it's less desirable. So we'll talk about that. Okay, so maybe uh, I'll sort of describe the uh, shale gas since we're all interested in shale gas. The US has a very different, you know, distribution of shale gas. It's all, uh, you know, on, on land. And, and, and they occur from 
places like North Dakota, which is out in the middle of nowhere. It's cold in the winter. There are not many people, lots of cows, but not a lot of people. All the way down through Texas, where there's massive amounts of this uh, shale gas. And now you have the industrial center in the US for chemicals and fuels is right here on the Gulf Coast. But there are things up in the mountains. Uh, where I live is right about here. And you can see in uh, these three states, there's lots of shale gas. So this is widely distributed. Methane is the largest component, and, uh, but ethane is the next largest component. And, and the total C2 to C4 hydrocarbons might be anywhere from 10% in, in a well to as much as 40%. And of that, the majority would be ethane. So the US shale gas problem at least part of it beyond methane is ethane. So we're trying to look at technology to take ethane to, to things. Now, if you're down here in the Texas Gulf Coast, there's a big chemical industry and you can make chemicals. But if you're up here in North Dakota or the mountains in Pennsylvania, there's no chemical industry. So we're really targeting fuels. And so fuels is kind of our target. And because we're doing ethane, we're gonna have to do really high temperature. The equilibrium for making ethylene is low, we're gonna to try to make ethylene and in, ethane into ethylene. And this is the reaction we'll talk about today. And I have several students working on this step. And then once we make olefins, there's a number of routes to turning these into hydrocarbon fuels. And so I also have students doing that, but we'll not, we'll not discuss that today. Okay, so we're gonna be looking at dehydrogenation. And so dehydrogenation is not new technology. It's over 60 years old. Every catalyst that's really seriously been investigated is based on platinum. This is the active element. And commercially, it's done with platinum tin. And platinum tin is, is known to make this face-centered cubic phase, a platinum three with tin as the promoter. And actually, there are four other elements. These are all post-transition elements which are patented to, to do dehydrogenation. Gallium is, is actually quite good. Zinc is actually commercially used in combination with zinc, but zinc or tin, sorry, tin, tin is far and away the most abundantly used catalyst with sometimes with a little promotion by zinc, but these others have been patented. All the promoters come from this part of the periodic table. There've been lots and lots of studies, structural, kinetic, density functional theory. And if you read this really nice paper by Bert Beckhausen from the Netherlands, this chemical review, you'll find that most of the literature would say the reason for adding the promoter, 10, is to not just to form this phase, but the biggest effect is you change the electronic properties of platinum. You change the chemistry of platinum. It leads to decreased heats of absorption, less the olefins stay on the surface less, they deactivate less. This gives rise to higher selectivity, longer life, and all the good things you want to do in a catalyst. So we were looking at uh, some of the limitations of tin is that it's great for propane and it works really beautifully up to 600 degrees, but ethane you're gonna have to go to maybe 750 or 800 degrees. And it's simply not stable enough there. So I'm looking for, you know, things that would behave equivalently, but operate at 800 degrees so that I can use ethane. So this is the structure, but the structure is not thought to be nearly as important as these electronic properties. So I had decided to look at some of the structures, which I'll show you how you do that in, in a bit. And we, came, we looked at platinum zinc, which is also well known, and it makes this body-centered cubic structure and it, it seemed to me that zinc is totally different from tin and the structure is actually different. What really is important is that you make small regions of platinum called ensembles. Three, one to three atoms is okay. Anything bigger than that and all of a sudden bad things happen. So if you put four platinum atoms together, the thing starts to become very poorly selective and, and very unstable. So we thought that these sort of structural things related to their geometry was much more important than the electronic thing. So that's sort of contradictory to the conventional wisdom. And so that's kind of me. I'm not afraid to try, you know, unconventional things. So what, what this story is about is trying to make a platinum chromium alloy. And why chromium? First, it's not known. Nobody's ever tried to make it or use it but it has this same structure as tin. 
So I can test this idea of whether geometry is important. And chromium is totally different than tin. It's not a post-transition element. It's an tra early transition element. And the electronic properties are completely different. So this component with chromium ought to be very different than tin, but the structure of the two are the same. So that's sort of the, the goal here. Now, let me repeat. This is not a story about catalysis. I'll try to tell the story of catalysis, but it's really about how do you use the tools to get at these fundamental issues in nanoparticles? And that's really the, the, the main message of the paper or the, the story today. So just a sort of a simple, if you're interested sort of thing, we start with a high surface area support, something like silica, aluminum is also fine. We simply dissolve nitrate salts in water and add them to the surface. We try to do that in a way we, there's a few tricks to making it uniformly dispersed. We'll heat that up in air to turn those nitrates into oxides. And then we'll add platinum in a second step and try to make that uniformly interacting. And then we reduce at some high temperature to make the alloys, the hope to make the alloys. In this particular study, we've made many different compositions, but I'm only gonna point to two, one with a lower chromium level, 1%, and then one with a 2%. And, and it's our perspective on all the catalysts that we've made and characterized that it's only the chromium near the platinum that ends up in the alloy. And there's lots of chromium remaining all over the surface. It's not close to platinum and it's very resistant to reducing and so it remains unchanged. But the real message of today's story is how do I characterize this alloy that we're trying to make quantitatively, carefully in all aspects so that I fully understand what makes it really function well, as well as if it's not functioning quite so well, what's the problem? Okay, so first thing we do is we put the things together, we cook it all up when we make things. And what we really wanna do is try to make some sort of catalyst. Platinum is our base catalyst. So we make some with platinum and we want them all to be about the same particle size. So we use electron microscopy. This is a simple bright field image. The little white spots are the platinum nanoparticles. We do a statistical distribution, which is shown here for, for the uh, platinum three chromium. And we get an average particle size and we can get a distribution. And this is relatively small nanoparticles on the range of two to three nanometers. So we add chromium to the platinum. It's about two nanometers for platinum. We can get about the same range. We can, we're, I'm gonna show you why we heat it to different temperatures, but we're gonna, in these conditions, we're gonna heat it at 550 where we do the reaction. And then we're gonna heat it at very high temperature to see if it's changed. And it centers a little bit and structurally it changes a little bit, which I'll show you in a moment. And the same thing happens with the with, when there's more chromium. We get small particles about the size, same size range. And when we go to higher temperatures, again, it centers a little bit. So these are actually thermally quite stable. Many of the catalysts we have when we heat to 800, they get very large and they're not very functional. But these are, are fairly stable. OK, so catalytic re reactions. So the first thing we do to figure out if we've done something besides make just platinum is we do a reaction. And so we put it in a plug flow reactor, run the gases over it and see what happens. So one of the things that's really bad is anytime you have hydrogen, it tends to break carbon carbon bonds. So we actually put hydrogen in the inlet to sort of force bad operating conditions. And the thought is here, if it can survive these conditions, it must be a pretty good catalyst. So the, the best catalyst here has selectivities over 95%. It doesn't change with conversions. You can push this out as far as you want. You can add more catalysts, lower the flow rates, change the space velocity. And this catalyst is no change in the, in the uh, selectivity out to the equilibrium conversion. Now, if we add 1% chromium, it's much better than platinum, which is here in blue. The platinum actually is, starts off much lower. And as you go higher conversions, it's, it's bad. So this is why people don't use platinum. It's not selective. It's less selective at higher conversions and it actually deactivates very fast. <laughs> and so all of that is a good reason not to use it. When you add chromium, it makes life better, but still, you know, when you get out here to high conversions, you're still only 85%. So that's really not good enough for um, commercial performance. And it also deactivates faster than, than you really want. 
when we add 3% chromium, well, very selective and it's very much less, less um, deactivating. So the question then becomes is, what's different about these catalysts as we change the chromium level? So what I really wanna ask is what's the structure of the nanoparticles that affects this catalytic performance and how can I get at those details? Okay, so our group goes out to the advanced photon source and uh, we do a couple different things. We do X-ray spectroscopy. So we talked about that yesterday and just to remind you and it's adsorption technique, we measure the photons. This is an ion chamber where we measure the photons coming in from the left. So we measure the initial number of photons. We send it through our sample and then we measure the photons coming out. And back here, we have a, uh, another experiment for cal energy calibration. We also, I'm also gonna show you some uh, diffraction that we do at the synchrotron. This is a, certainly a different instrument. The photons come from the, the right here. There's a little cell here. It's just a little capillary tube with heaters and thermocouples and gases. We, we line through there and we actually do it in transmission and we measure on this screen. Now, because we're at a, a, a synchrotron, we can use very high energy, which is actually quite important in terms of getting the diffraction pattern of these very small nanoparticles. Okay, so let me just back up a little bit and talk about the techniques. I wanna sort of review what we did very briefly because we talked about this a lot yesterday. We're gonna tune the X-ray beam to an atom in our sample, in this case, platinum. We're going to, below the edge, have no adsorption. It's not enough energy to, to excite. And we're looking at a 2P electron in, uh, in platinum, it's called an L edge, L3 edge. And when we're below that L3 edge, which is a little over 11,000 electron volts or 11 keV, nothing happens. At the edge, we ionize it into a valence shell and we get a rise in the adsorption. We, so we adsorb photons and the edge looks like this peak here. And so just about 30 eV beyond the edge, we give it enough energy to escape with kinetic energy. It goes off as a wave. It scatters from the neighbors. And in this case, it's gonna be either another platinum atom or it's gonna be a chromium atom when we're making the alloys. And we get oscillations. These are the XFs. They go out, we go about one keV in energy. And this region here is called the edge or the zanes. This region is the scattering, different phenomena scattering of the photoelectron, which gives you structure. Okay, so this is what the zanes of platinum looks like. The thing that's important about the zanes is the inflection point of the leading edge. So that's somewhere right here. You take the derivative and you look for the maximum in the first derivative. And for pure platinum, this is a pure platinum catalyst is, or foil, which is big thick, is the blue. And when we make really, really tiny nanoparticles, we get some distortion at the top of the spectrum and a little beyond, but the leading edge is the same. Okay, so we can tell from the edge energy, and this is called the white line, and the height of the white line, as you oxidize the materials, they usually get larger and actually shift to higher energy. So we can tell the oxidation states from the zanes. And the excess, we, we go back, we isolate the excess, we process the data, we look, usually look at it as the Fourier transform. And because we're gonna be looking at Platinum, I wanted to show you what platinum looks like. There are three main peaks in the platinum uh, spectrum. The center peak is the largest. The highest um, radius is uh, the middle and there on the low, low R side is the lowest. And so we're gonna see that in these alloys, there's gonna be changes in the shape of this and changes in the shape of that, okay? And just to remind you what we learned from excess is the types of neighbors, in this case, platinum or chromium, we're gonna, not, the numbers of neighbors, and we're gonna see that that's important in terms of understanding the structure and also the bond distances, which is also important to doing the structure. And because we have cells and gases, we can do this under different treatment conditions or even under different reaction conditions. And we'll, we'll talk about that as we go along. So here's actually the XFs taken from the isolation we make this and we actually have to do some analysis to process to turn the picture into a quantitative answer. So this, if I fit the 
magnitude of the Fourier transform and the imaginary part, I come up with, there are platinum platinum bonds. This is a platinum nanoparticle, nothing else in it. And I get a bond distance of 2.69 angstroms. Now that's first time I did this, I said, wow, that's a really contracted bond distance. Typically platinum foil is 2.77 and forcing two platinum atoms closer together, especially like a 10th of an angstrom is a pretty, pretty strained kind of sample. And it turns out when you get down to nanoparticles, there are changes in the bond length, especially the surface atoms. So I had one, oh, before I do that. So what you get is a coordination number. The smaller the coordination number, the smaller the particle up to 12, which is a big thick foil. And so this is a sort of a standard data, but coordination numbers don't really mean anything. What you'd really like to do is translate that into size, just like a TEM, how big is the particle? So I did that a little different way than most people do. I made lots of platinum catalysts. These are, uh, some of these are on alumina, some of these are on silica, and I don't even remember which ones are the, probably the open circles are on silica and the, the dark ones are on, um, alumina, but it doesn't matter. I made the platinum of different sizes and I measured their excess and I get coordination numbers. Some are really low and some are close to the bulk foil. Now, in order to convert that to size, platinum is one of those metals where you can actually do hydrogen chemisorption, measure the number of surface atoms, and then there are models to turn that dispersion into a particle size. And so I did that. And so I measured the log of the dispersion, which I can then translate into particle size. And you can see there's a nice correlation with the, the XF's coordination numbers. Therefore, when I do something now and I measure a coordination number about seven, I can go up here, pick a dispersion, figure out what that is and translate that into a particle size. So let me go back here. I'm interested in why is this bond distance so short? You know. If, when I showed this to some of my DFT friends, they said, wow, that's really interesting. You know, that would affect our uh, modeling because we always assume bulk values, but in small particles, which is what we use in catalysis, this is quite a different thing. And you get quite a different energy distribution when you strain the size like that. So that's why I'm interested in some of the sizes. So here's a plot of a whole bunch of platinum catalysts on different supports. And the, the bulk value is 2.77. And you can see that when I'm on some of these, you know, nine, nine 10 nanometers, it's uh, got bulk properties. And when you come down somewhere in here are three to four nanometers, all of a sudden the bond distances start to get really short. And when you get between one and two nanometers, they get quite short. So the one that I was looking at there that I was showing you the data, was somewhere here, and but you can even make them quite a bit smaller. The important part of this thing is the bond distance do change with size, but they're quite independent of the support. This is not an epitaxial growth so that the support is forcing some sort of geometry, which is sometimes happens in oxides for sure. So you can determine it. So we get the bond distances as one of the key informations. And the critical point for nanoparticles this is somewhere around three to four nanometers in size. Okay, so let me turn to diffraction. We're gonna look at diffraction and let me sort of explain nanoparticles and diffraction in a synchrotron. Um, before we went off to try to do alloys, I wanted to be sure these particle sizes in the range of one to two nanometers are so small, the peaks are so broad that you can't actually detect them in a lab instrument. And we tried for 24 hours to detect these things and we couldn't see any nanoparticles. You see some amorphous support, but uh, we couldn't see the nanoparticles. So we went to the synchrotron. Well, let me add one other, one other thought. When I actually take a one nanometer nanoparticle and I reduce it and do XFs, I showed you the, the XFs, right? you get metal, metal particles. If I expose this to air at room temperature, these metal particles disappear and I get a platinum oxide. Small particles have nearly every atom on the surface. Those atoms oxidize. I no longer have metallic peaks. So my thought was, if I'm trying to do small nanoparticles and I do the sample in air, which is how I, you would normally do it in a lab instrument, I've oxidized all the metal particles. There are no peaks to analyze. So we thought we have to do this in situ, 
we need better signal to noise. So we tried to do this all at the, at the synchrotron. So we picked a, instead of an amorphous lumina, a semi-crystalline, this is a theta lumina. It's, it's not a necessarily important. We hope that the, the order of the support would allow us to take the spectra, take the spectra with the platinum nanoparticles on it, and these are the ones that are reduced, and then subtract the support and be left over with the nanoparticles. So here's the support, here's the platinum on the alumina with platinum nanoparticles that were first reduced and then exposed to air, and then reduced and kept reduced. Now, I'm sure you can't tell from this tiny little figure that there are any differences. In fact, if I blew that up the size of you know, a wall, you still couldn't see where the nanoparticles are. But the fact is that there's, they're there, and you can see them in a microscope, you can see them in XFs. And what's an advantage of the synchrotron is it's so stable and so reproducible to make the support, you can subtract the support from the reduced particles. And while it's noisy and they're broad, you actually get peaks. And these index exactly like platinum nanoparticles. And in fact, if you do the, you know, the unit cell size and determine the lattice parameters, the bond distance is exactly what I show here for this one. It's contracted. The peaks are at a slightly higher angle because the bond distances contract, okay? So you can, in fact, do one nanometer size particles. We did bias it a little bit. We put 2% platinum on there instead of trying to do real low levels, but still you can do it. If we then do it the way you'd normally do it in a laboratory and take the spectra, oxidize it in air, and then take the XRD, this is from the support, and you can see the metallic peaks are now not present. You've oxidized every metal peak. And we did this by XFs and small angle scattering and pair distribution at the synchrotron. All of these uh, techniques confirm the same things. If you want to look at really small nanoparticles, you have to do it in situ. Air at room temperature is not inert to a metal nanoparticle. And that may be true to some of your catalytic species. So in situ measurements are really important. And because of the high flux and the high signal to noise, you can really do things like take different spectra between some sort of background. We do this in infrared spectroscopy all the time, a background and then the background with your sample. And you can take the two and, and isolate the, the peaks, okay? So that's what you have to do to do the diffraction. And so here's the uh, diffractometer that I showed before. Uh, we come in and let me give you some of the details. This little capillary reactor could heat to 600 degrees. Since then, I bought a much more uh, nice uh, commercial cell. It'll go up to 1,000 degrees, so we can treat this in any gas at any temperature up to 1,000. The beauty of the synchrotron is the flux is so high, we can do this in five minutes. So you really can time, time dependent. Is there a question? Oh, I think it was just a problem with some microphone. Go ahead. Sir. Professor, your, your microphone is mute. It's mute. I don't know how I did that. I must have accidentally hit it. Sorry. Okay. So the uh, synchrotron has very high flux. And so you not only can get the spectra if you have a spectra that are a little bit more uh, metals, a little bit larger sizes, you can actually do very fast time at data acquisition. The other thing that's kind of unique at the synchrotron is you use very high energy uh, photons. So these are 105 keV rather than the typical copper or molybdenum images in a laboratory. And what that does is that actually removes things like silica and alumina backgrounds and makes them much more transparent and the heavy metals show up. There's much better contrast when you use these high energies. Now I'm gonna show you when you use the high energies, it also changes the angle. We're, we're looking at much lower angles. So they use a big detector screen. This is an area detector screen and they can move this back and forth to really get very high uh, angle resolution, which is sometimes needed. But in order to do the nanoparticles, we had to do two things. We had to use, or three things. We had to use the synchrotron. 
we actually had to determine the difference between the support and the catalyst, and we had to keep the, the catalyst reduced. Okay, so if you do that, you can then start to do nanoparticles, and since then I'll show you things for, for uh, alloys that we can do as well. Okay, so let's get back to the platinum chromium story and see what you would do with these nice fancy techniques. So we made these catalysts, they're different than platinum. They look different than platinum. And so we did the first thing we did is the zanes. And so here's the zanes. Then the, in this case, the blue one is platinum. And so it, this things that have a white line about this intensity are metallic in character. Things that have this edge energy, here's the inflection point, they're metallic. And so platinum, the, the standard, you know, Answer is 11564 is a metallic platinum, pure platinum foil and nanoparticles as well. Now, when we add a little bit of chromium, what happens is there's a slight shift in the position and a slight change in the shape of the white line. And that's usually characteristic of some sort of second scatterer. In this case, it'll be in chromium. And you can see it's not a very big change. It's 0.3 EV out of 11,000. But the reproducibility at the synchrotron is so high that this is very reproducible. The, uh, the one with more chromium, which was the better catalyst, the black one, isn't very different, uh, maybe slightly. But if you actually quantify it, it's, it's not really very different. And all we can tell from this is that these are probably bimetallic catalysts. They look metallic from the white line and they're slightly different in their shape. This is typically characteristic of a bimetallic catalyst. Now, you can also do the XFs region, which gives you the structure. So platinum, here's a platinum nanoparticle in black. It has the three peaks, here's one, two and three, it's hard, kind of hard to see some of these because of the overlap. And when we put in 1% chromium, we get a second scatter, a small amount out of the 10 atoms, the platinum has 10 neighbors, eight are platinum, two are chromium, okay? And you can fit the bond distances and it changes the shape ever so slightly. The platinum in the middle comes down and the platinum at the edge goes up here for the, or goes down for the green one and up for the blue one. So there are subtle changes here. The imaginary parts are subtly changed. And when you fit it, you'd say, look, I see chromium, definitely see chromium. So there is a chromium alloy. These bond distances are metallic distances. But the difference between the, the best catalyst and the one that you probably wouldn't use, it's not hardly enough to tell that there's any difference at all. Now, keep in mind that these are average structures and chemistry occurs on the surface. And so if we're really going to understand the chemistry of nanomaterials, we have to sort of develop surface sensitive techniques. And so that's, that's certainly the long-term goal. Here, all, all what I tell, can tell from XFs is I have chromium neighbors. It doesn't match any alloy composition, so I don't know if I've made an alloy, solid solution. I don't know whether platinum's on the surface or platinum chromium's on the surface, or I have two phases. All of those are possible from XFs. Okay, so this uh, is, we want to know which phase we formed. Oftentimes we're forming these uh, ordered phases, but that's not necessarily the only thing that can form. So we took uh, this, I'll just show the, the diffraction of one. This is the alloy that, or the bimetallic that we made, the one I just showed you some of the XFs for. There is chromium in this sample, but if I look at the peaks of this sample and match it up to any of the references, it clearly doesn't match chromium. It's pretty close to platinum pretty close to platinum three chromium. It's probably far enough away, certainly out here at the higher angles. It doesn't match those peaks. It's not a one-to-one -one alloy and it's clearly not the uh, one-to-three alloy. So we can reject these two, but we really can't tell if it's this, this, or some combination of things. Now, if we made a full alloy, these are the, uh, the alloy structures. If we made this alloy, 
which we don't make, the, there are no platinum platinum bonds. So if we start to combine the X-ray diffraction with the XFs, well, no platinum platinum bonds. Well, here's the excess. We have lots of platinum platinum bonds. So that can't be the structure that's formed. Uh, and of course, that's consistent with the diffraction. We could have formed this one where the ratio of platinum platinum bonds to platinum chromium is about two chromium for each platinum. This is a very chromium rich alloy. We go back here. Neither one of these is chromium rich. If we made this alloy, the ratio of chromium to platinum is one to two. And you can see chromium to platinum is one to four. So we didn't make a pure alloy. So we could have either a core shell where we have platinum three chromium and some excess platinum, or we could have sort of a homogeneous solid solution. And the difference in morphology is important from a catalytic performance point of view. And we'll try to figure out which of those things is, is going on. Oops, sorry, went too far. Oop. Okay, so in looking at the two different catalysts, uh, the, the, with the 1% chromium and the 3%, uh, you can see that the 1% is in green, the peaks line up pretty closely. You know, the, the, again, the black one, they line up pretty closely and they're kind of consistent with this platinum three chromium, but you can see these two structures of platinum and platinum three chromium are very close in the diffraction pattern. It's very hard to resolve these, especially when the peaks are broad. So what do you, what should you do? So from just this, the analysis of the catalyst that we've made that we tested for the catalytic performance from X-ray diffraction, even at a synchrotron and from XFs and, and even from TEM, there's nothing that we can tell why one should be different from the others. Okay, now, um, what we thought we would do is then take one of the, take these samples and reduce them in higher temperature. Chromium is difficult to reduce. And so as you, as you, as we've studied the, the synthesis of these materials, the higher temperature you reduce, the first thing that happens is you get a nanoparticle of the metal like platinum. Then you start to reduce the oxide. It starts to diffuse into the surface and it continues to diffuse in until you form a full alloy. So you get first a core shell, first a nanoparticle, then a core shell, and then a full alloy. So we went ahead and started temperatures. Okay, so here's the XFs. And this is of the 3%, the higher loading, but the same trends are shown for the, the 1%. So if we start with platinum, when we reduced at 550, there was a shift in the edge. It was small, but real. And when we eat the temperature up to 800 degrees, it continues to shift. So the structure of the particle actually changes with temperature. So you put in the composition and if I heat it at one temperature, I get one answer and I hit it at a different temperature, I get a different answer. Okay, the XFs is over here. The platinum is the blue one. When we made the uh, 550 degree, that was the one we looked at before. This went down, this goes up, uh, this goes up a little bit. We're having platinum with chromium. So that's what we showed before at this four to one ratio. When we start to heat it up, you'll notice the peaks in general get bigger. That's consistent with centering. And, and in fact, from electron microscopy, we see the particle center from about two nanometers up to three nanometers. If we look at the excess now, what we get is a increase in the amount of chromium in the nanoparticle. So at 800 degrees, we have four chromium to two platinum. And this is exactly the ratio of the platinum three chromium alloy that I showed here, two chromium or one chromium to two platinum in the coordination number. So at 800 degrees, this centering has made slightly larger particles, a little bit bigger shift in the edge, and we seem to have made the uh, three to one alloy. Now I'll repeat, XFs is not a good method for trying to determine precise structures. Unless you know everything in your sample is uniform, 
and it has a, a uniform composition, then you're, you can start to do that. But you can use it in this, com where this is called an intermetallic compound, and so the stoichiometry is fixed, and so if you've truly made this phase as a pure phase, it will have the right coordination ratio. So there are limits to what you can do by looking at the structure. Much better is to look at diffraction. So here's what we looked at, broad peaks, you know, small particles, shift in the lattice constant. You can't tell whether this is really a new phase or whether this is just some small nanoparticle and change in the lattice constant. But when we heat it up to 800 degrees, the particles sharpen because we made slightly larger particles. The peaks are consistent with the platinum three chromium. And now we even pick up the super lattice lines, which are very small features. We couldn't see these over here. They would be in this region here. They're just too broad, we can't see them. But we have every super lattice parameter and every peak is in the right position for the platinum three chromium. And because we have slightly, slightly larger particles, the lattice constant not, is no longer subject to the small changes in the very small nanoparticles. Once we're at the three nanometer, it's much like the bulk. We even start to see small amounts of chromium oxide in the diffraction pattern as well. So we have a cell, we heat it up to 800 degrees and we can take the sample after that and we can do it in situ without exposing to air. So all things have told, all the char bulk characterizations have told us that, you know, the platinum three chromium phase is the one that forms. And by the time we get to 800 degrees, it's the full alloy nanoparticle. And, and that's confirmed by just the diffraction, the super lattice peaks, and even the excess, we get the right coordination ratio. All right, so that's not a solid solution. It's not space separated particles. But what about the catalytic surface? This is really what you want to know. And the catalytic surface, I'll repeat, XFS measures every atom in the sample. And I only want to know about the monolayer of atoms that are at the surface of these nanoparticles. How can I do that when I have hard x-rays and I see every atom in the sample? So we're going to actually do a chemistry trick. We're going to, we're going to do the catalyst reduced. This gives us every atom. We see every atom that's there. Whether I have a platinum core and an alloy surface or it's a full alloy, you see every atom. Now chemistry, if I oxidize these at room temperature, platinum will, in, in these oxides, these nanopart metallic nanoparticles will oxidize only in the surface monolayer. This has been studied a lot on a whole variety of methods for the past 40 years. So this is well known that if you just do surface oxidation, which just means expose it to air at room temperature, you will oxidize the surface metal atoms. And in this case, if I have an alloy, it's both platinum, which is show here, chromium oxide would be formed, but I'm using the platinum edge, I wouldn't see that. So I would see the loss of metallic platinum platinum bonds and I would see the gain. I now create new platinum oxygen bonds. The core is exactly the same as the core over here. These, uh, this mild treatment doesn't change any of the internal atoms in the particle, either their structure or composition. So if I take this spectrum and my signal to noise is really high and I take this spectrum and the signal to noise is really high, which is what you get at a synchrotron, then the core subtracts out. And what I'm left with is I have more metallic particles in this particle. So I have a metal alloy surface here and I have some oxygen, platinum oxygen peaks here. So let me show you what that looks like. Here is the spectrum. The black is the reduced spectrum of the catalyst. I guess maybe uh, in this one, it's the red one. No, it, no, it's the black one that's reduced, sorry. So the black one is reduced and this is a combination of platinum, platinum and platinum chromium bonds. And then when we oxidize it, we lose just a little bit of the metallic bonds and we gain a little bit in the oxygen. Now, the problem with doing the XFs analysis on the oxidized particle and trying to figure out what the surface is like, it's such a small change that it's in the fitting is, has errors in it. 
that it's really hard to do that precisely. So what we do, if we do this method up here, where we take the reduced sample and subtract out the oxidized sample, this is the difference spectrum. These are the platinum and chromium bonds, and this is the platinum oxygen bond. Now, the, there's some peculiarities about this bond because of the subtraction process, but in, in just take it on for, for granted for now that you can actually fit that. And we get that there's about one platinum platinum and 0.5 platinum chromium. And so even in this spectra that was very platinum rich, the surface looks to have a platinum to chromium ratio of about two to one, which was this platinum three alloy. So I'll go back and remind you that this platinum chromium to platinum platinum ratio of two is consistent with this platinum three chromium. This is the platinum platinum to platinum chromium. This is the two to one ratio. In addition, we get the number of oxygens on the surface of the particle. These are the catalytic sites. And so we can actually count the number of catalytic sites. If we try to do any chemisorption at all, CO, hydrogen, the typical kinds of things, you know, platinum will absorb hydrogen and CO, but so does chromium because it's a metallic phase. So you don't get the proper number of active sites, whereas when we oxidize the surface and we are only analyzing at the platinum edge, we don't see the chromium oxide, we only see the platinum oxide. So we can actually calculate from this the number of active atoms, okay? And so here's what we would do from all the analysis, this is the standard analysis. You measure every atom in the sample and you try to determine the structure. And if it's uniform, that's great. But you can see the average of these two catalysts is about the same. If we look at the interior, what's the interior? The interior are those atoms which didn't oxidize. We can analyze those metallic peaks plus the surface and we can get some estimate of that. We can look at the particle interior well, the particle interior here is very similar. Here, it's uh, slightly different. But the thing that's important for catalysis is the surface. Here, the ratio is less than 0.5, which is the, the coordination ratio. Therefore, we have some free exposed platinum, which is non-selective. We have some platinum three chromium, which is selective. So this catalytic properties or a combination of sites which have not formed the alloy, it still remain metallic platinum, and some alloy surface which is, is, uh, it has high selectivity. When we finally make a monolayer, the catalyst selectivity goes up to the maximum. And from the XFs, what we see is a combination of platinum chromium bonds, but we see a platinum core, which is why we have the high coordination numbers of uh, Platinum, platinum, okay? So you can actually do this at a whole variety of, of temperatures. And so, so we did for sure. And, and so this was the data I showed you at 550, but if you wanna sort of start looking at, well, how do I form alloys and what is the, temp, what is the composition under different temperatures? <coughs> platinum reduces at about 175. By 250, chromium is pretty hard to reduce by itself, but when it's near platinum, you can start to do the reduction at least a little bit on the surface at 250. And you can follow that. And you know, you can get you can you can do all these things. Now there is one caveat to this, this method. So if I go back to the, the method here, in order to do this reliably, I have to have a high fraction of surface atoms. If I make really big particles, which usually means over about 10, maybe 12 nanometers, the fraction of surface atoms is not high enough to see because when I do the subtraction, the errors in the data really give me errors in the, in the analysis of the difference. So you really want small particles. And these happen to be really small particles, but you can do this at five nanometers, seven nanometers. It's just so much, so much nicer. But with the new synchrotrons and the improved signal to noise, this is this may even be possible at uh, you know larger particle sizes.
Okay, so let me sort of summarize the catalytic results. Uh, we start with platinum and it's not really very good. And, you know, the selectivities are low. If we have a limited amount of chromium, and by the way, we have about five molar time, five, five molar equivalents of chromium to make this platinum three chromium alloy. It's just that most of the chromium is out on the support, doesn't really overlap with the platinum. And we can tell that by doing the chromium edge and we see only chromium oxide. So 90, 95% of the chromium is present as an oxide and not in the presence of the alloy. From the platinum edge, we can see the alloy formation. And when we make this, it's better. Certainly it's better than that, but it's not nearly as good as a monolayer. If we keep pushing the, you know, the temperatures and force the reduction, we can make a full alloy at, at 800 degrees. And if we go back to 550 and test it, the catalytic results are quite nice. Okay, so once you know how to do all these things and you have all sorts of different information, you can start to think about, well, how thick is this alloy shell? So I, I, I mentioned that here, there's hardly any chromium in this sample, yet when you get to this, it's a full alloy. Could I, as I go along, determine the, the shell thickness? You know, is that even possible? Well, it is if you, if you do a couple things. You have to have the particle size by TEM, which we have. You have to have the XFs of the particle itself. And you have to know which phase you formed, that is the stoichiometry of the alloy phase, which we did by diffraction and ultimately XFs. If you take all of those things, you can actually determine the composition uh, and thickness of this uh, surface layer. And so the way you do that is from the total coordination, it, 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 if we reduced it at 500, there was a shell and there was a platinum interior. All of the platinum in the, in the center has platinum platinum bonds, but there are also platinum platinum bonds in the platinum chromium. So to, to estimate the, the amount of platinum platinum in the shell, we take the platinum chromium coordination number and we multiply it by two, which is the stoichiom stoichiometric limit. We subtract that from the total and we're left with the platinum platinum in the middle and based on those correlations I showed you before, you can estimate the size in nanometers of the interior core as well as the shell. And by doing that, you know, you can then divide by two to get the thickness. So this is something that we did and it was kind of fun to do, but you have to know all the things, the TEM, diffraction, XFs, and then for all these different statements. So we did this for a bunch of different treatments and you can see, even though we see chromium in the, at 250, it's not a full atomic layer. It's only up to about 550 Do we get a monolayer. By 700, we had three monolayers. And by 800, we had a full particle. And from the size, it's about six monolayers from, from side to side. So this actually shows you, this can be used to show you how you actually grow alloys. At two, I didn't show you the data at 175, but it's pure platinum. And then the chromium oxide starts to reduce, but just a little bit. And then you start to get full monolayer coverage somewhere around 550, and then you start to form an alloy. So that's, that's kind of the way we see the formation of all of these alloys. So I have sort of covered all of this before. Let me sort of <clears throat> finish. I really wanted this to be about synchrotrons. And you can use these techniques in ways beyond just the standard. I put it my sample on the beam and I get the structure and I try to answer questions. You can use references, you can use chemical treatments, you can use you know, other, other strategies to, to figure out the, the kinds of information that you want from, from, these, uh, from your nanomaterials. Um, you know, whenever it's possible, if you're looking for an ordered alloy, diffraction is great. Uh, they can now go down to about, you know, one to two nanometers, especially if you do it in situ. And you can even do those under reaction conditions that, uh, you know, that's certainly easy to do. Um, I, I really like this surface structure analysis. I think it has, I've done this with uh, organometallic molecules. When you absorb them onto supports, you lose certain ligands and you form certain other things. You do reactions, the coordination number changes. Um, you can look at 
some of these changes during synthesis, reactions, you can look at mechanisms, you can estimate uh, morphologies, which uh, sometimes are not easy to do by TEM. And that's much beyond the standard, just stick it in a beam and do the XFs. So let me, let me sort of finish with the catalysis story since uh, I sort of walked you through that. My current view is I've made alloys of platinum with all of these 3D transition elements and even a few more. We've made palladium, same things. We see a lot of platinum 3M um, with cobalt, iron, manganese, chromium, and vanadium. And those are totally different electronically. And yet the catalysts are su actually superior in some, some ways. We can make palladium and clearly palladium with things like manganese, chromium, vanadium are not platinum tin. So electronic things are important. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying to say it's unimportant, but you can make alloys and see electronic changes and they're not great catalysts, or you can make these ordered intermetallic structures and they're always 95 to 100% selective. And I, this is, so this is my view, this contrary view. I believe that the essence of these alloy catalysts is all about structure and geometry and small ensemble. Okay. So that's my, uh, that concludes my talk. I'd be happy to take any questions. We don't have to talk about my talk. We can talk about some of your materials. What kinds of things would you be interested in doing? Uh, you know, I've done oxides, I've done phosphides, I've done sulfides, I've done organometallics, I've done whatever you like. Uh, okay, thank you, Jeffrey. Very interesting uh, analysis, very, very creative. And, and Time consuming, I guess, but uh, you can well, get a lot know, of information, right? Yeah, it's step by step. So we, yeah, you know, step we, by step. we did diffraction on, on platinum, on aluminum. I mean, I mean, everybody, I have lots of diffraction friends who are real experts. I'm not an expert. And they all told me you can't do diffraction on nanoparticles at the size I wanted to do. And I said, well, you know, look in the XFs, I see metallic peaks, and those peaks disappear completely when I expose to air. You guys do all your diffraction in air. So why would you expect to see metallic peaks? I said, I'm gonna try that. I know it's kind of a dumb idea. You're the expert and I'm not. And sure enough, we saw it in small angle scattering. We saw it in pair distribution. We saw it in XFs and we saw it in diffraction. When I showed the diffraction, I showed the woman who ran the diffraction beam line. She says, oh, you can't do that. And I said, but look at this. And she said, oh. And she thought for a minute and says, oh, this is what you're doing. And she said, oh, yes, we can do that now. She realized that these high energies, the, the support becomes transparent and that the, if you can keep the particles reduced, you can actually do it. That's just the diffraction part of the story. Every one of these things, I love to develop these new strategies and these new techniques and cells to run new kinds of materials at very different conditions. You know, that's, that's where the interesting science is happening. And you can- okay, you can use the experts at the synchrotron, by the way, to help you with all of the, the details of all these things. They're the real experts on how to make, you know, the instruments do what you want. Yeah, so let's open for questions. I think we have already one in the, in the chat. Uh, Rafael, do you wanna speak up? I think it's halfway your question. I am elaborating. Ah, okay, so we can wait. Any other question? <laughs> I have one quick question, Jeff. Uh, when you show the XF's uh, Fourier transform, there are two two lines. I, maybe I, I have missed it, but uh, is that like a real and imaginary part? Oh, yes, like yes. You mean... Uh... Yes, yeah, sometimes there are two Here. lines, right? There. Yeah. Here. Yeah. So, so this is the the data. If I go back to the spectrum, these are the oscillations. Mm -hmm. What we do is we subtract off the absorption edge. We redefine the origin not in terms of energy, but in terms of kinetic energy. Yep. And we isolate all these peaks, and we do a little manipulation of the data, which which changes the size. It's called K weighting. Yeah. This is the raw interference pattern. And as I said yesterday, 
I can look at interference patterns and I have no clue what it means. All I know about this one is there's, there's signal out here, which means it's a heavy metal. That's all I can tell. Oxides tend to fall off by about 10. To go from this energy space called K space to a distance geometry representation, which I can, I can relate to geometry much easier than I can to energy in, just in uh, interference, I do a Fourier transform. And the Fourier transform of this data creates a magnitude which is the solid line and an imaginary part. So in the, in the fitting process, what you do is you fit all of that. Now I've heard many, many people say to me, well, you know, you can fit anything. And the answer is sure, if you don't, if you're not careful, you can fit anything. But if you're careful and you fit the shape of the, both the magnitude and the imaginary part, there's really not much room for errors in this. Now you do have to be a little careful, but um, you know. Okay, I, yeah, it's an indirect map, but yeah, it works. Yeah. Okay. And this is, so this I, is what we cover in the class that I teach is yeah. how to go from the raw spectrum here to getting down to this. This is actually what tells you what's going on. What's the coordination number? What kinds of atoms are there and how far apart are they? This is, this is how you answer research questions. This is, this is fine, but this is really the answer. We have to get to this point. So this is a simulation or, you, or I mean, to get to this number, you simulate like a, a cluster of atoms or is just a, a... Well, so what you do, there's two different approaches. You can make a material that's like what you think your material is. And so for, for this, what I do is I take a platinum foil so I show you the zanes here, but we have the whole spectrum. Platinum foil is platinum atoms with only platinum neighbors at 2.77 angstroms. And we use that as a reference and we get the interference pattern of what platinum looks like. And then we use that in fitting the unknown samples and the software then allows you to take, well, this, this is the reference. This is all based on a diffraction well-known structure. So references are critical. This is, okay. I like to do experimental references because they're really nice and precisely known. This is then the model fit with the software that you do by making what are called phase and amplitude functions. Okay. If you have something like platinum chromium that's, that's in these alloys, you can't find a reference. There is no valid reference. So you have to go to a program written by the University of Washington. John Rear at the University of Washington has written a program called FEF. I don't remember what all that FEF is, but it's a, it's a theory program that is theoretical scattering. And you can put in the elemental number. So platinum has an atomic number. What is it? 78 and chromium. You can put in that atomic number. You can put in a bond distances and it calculates theoretically the phases and amplitudes. So you can also do that. And so then you, for, for whatever atoms you think are in your sample, you can then back out the structure, number of atoms on distances and other things. Okay, excellent, thank you. I think uh, we have one question in the chat. Uh, um, in the case, I have a question. I work with Sylvia and I want to work with oxygen vacancies. And comparing to your talk, I want to ask if the focus to work in these vacancies could be more effective looking for geometry of structures than electronegativity. Okay, so, so, so yeah, so, so the question that I would ask, is this going to happen to the whole material or is this going to uh, happen at the surface? I'm sorry, he, he finished that. That is like thin film, serial thin films. So. Oh, th serial film, thin yeah. films, that's great. So if you have thin films where the thickness is not, you know, there's not a huge bulk. So if I do cerium and I have this really big bulk particle, I'm gonna get bulk cerium oxide, regardless of what happens at the surface. That happens in the nanomaterials too. But if I have a nice thin film and I, I do that sample say in air and I have cerium four, and then I do some sort of treatment and create holes, defects. First, I'm gonna make some cerium three. I'll see that in the edge. And then I'm gonna have some sort of 
vacancies, but what you analyze is the cerium at the surface and you would get the coordination. So how did that change? Okay, and you could do that by the difference that I was showing. So are the thin film, the question is, are the thin films less than about five nanometers? Or does thin films mean millimeters? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's a good question, Rafael. I think we can do it as thin as yeah. we want. Less than five, I think it's too much, you know? Well, we, so, we work with bigger numbers, I guess. Okay, so if the surface only and it were 10, 10 nanometers thick, we might have difficulty seeing it. We probably can see something. The Zanes is a big feature. The structure is, is a weaker signal. I mean, just look, look back here at platinum. The Zanes is this great big feature here from the zero to over one. The XFs are like here. This is where the structure is. But you guys mm -hmm. are gonna get a new big powerful synchrotron. Maybe your sensitivity will be much better. Than I would love to have something with a hundred times more sensitivity. Then the questions you're asking are certainly doable. This is where the, the, the advanced photon source is also gonna go through an upgrade in about a year. And at that point, it should be a hundred times more flux. That means the signal to noise is a hundred times better. That's definitely something that we should try. Whoever gets the best synchrotron first, I guess, is we can give it a shot. <laughs> okay. So, so thank you. So I guess they're, both, they're probably all closed right now. We, we can we can only talk about it. Yes. Yeah. That's great. Andre, do do you think you, you we can think something about these serious films to work in synchrotron or yes. Absolutely. And sure. if you do yeah. anything like yeah. dopants, if you put dopants into this yeah. area, the dopants are yeah, in low concentration, idea. and that's something you can do pretty easily. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Professor Fernando Marquez has a question, please. And then... Yes. Uh, thanks, Jeff. I think it was a very nice presentation. I, I, I'm asking myself, uh, these, these tiny nanoparticles that you are producing, what, what do you know about the stability of them under typical working conditions? Can you really survive with, because you showed their performance is, is really great, but is there any kind of, as you said, when you you hit them, they tend to center. They, so can, can you comment on that please? Yes, uh, so, so I think, let me get back to the end where I had the periodic table. So one of the problems with platinum 10 is that if you're operating at 600 degrees, which is propane dehydrogenation, they're stable for, they last for about three days, they're regenerated. And so they can, for a two year period, they can be used commercially. When you go to higher temperature, even a little bit, these, the, the tin that's excess covers it up, it poisons the thing and they center and they do all sorts of bad things and they're done. Once they do that, they're done. The problem is that the excess oxide from tin oxide on these will reduce. I started looking at these because manganese, chromium, and vanadium, you can't reduce the oxides even at 1,000 degrees. The second property that's important is the alloy that you form, these platinum tin alloys. This platinum on, with tin has a melting point that's much lower than on chromium. So centering, which is your question, is much more prone on the tin. We've taken the manganese one and why manganese? Chromium's toxic, vanadium's toxic, manganese is not toxic. So my, my choice, these all three perform pretty well. We've run these at 750 degrees for up to a week with no centering at all. We can regenerate them. I think these are pretty fantastic. They have a very high temperature melting point. They don't center. For some reason, they don't seem to make a lot of carbon on the catalyst either, which, I, which we're gonna try to study next. But, the structure gives you selectivity and better stability, but the centering resistance is all about the melting point. These are really far superior than to these post-transition elements. Yeah. So thanks for that question. Thank you. Okay, there was somebody else raised the hand, had the hand. Fabiani, no? Okay. 
Uh, yes, yes. I'll, I have a one question. Go ahead. So thank you, Professor Mimer, again for the for the lecture. So I would like to ask. So I've been work with the system serial lanthanum. So I would like to know in my system the amount of the vacancies and the local structure, like with the undopped Syria and doped Syria, because I've been working putting like different amount of lanthanum, and I would like to know how the the serial oxygen bonds will change in the system. So have you experienced to measure like something in Syria or in Lantanium and then what's the issues for the measurements in the system? So, so thank you. Uh, so lots of people like cerium. Cerium is sort of an amazing material on its own. We have looked at Lanthanum I don't know that in cerium, but we think I think we looked at it on alumina, stabilized in alumina. So yes, lanthanum. Let's see, lanthanum is here. Um, so lanthanum is always plus three. It doesn't reduce like cerium, so you're not going to see a redox property, but you might see the loss of some oxygen coordination if you were at the surface. So if in the surface there were six bonds, and then as you start to reduce the seria, you might lose and might form five bonds, we definitely would see something like that. As a dopant, it's there in a minor concentration, you know, one, three, five percent, whatever you're doing. And so we can definitely do the lanthanum fairly easily in Syria and look at what's happening around the lanthanum. Now, as the, the, the previous question asked about the cerium surface, if you had this as a single and a thin film, you could look at both the changes in oxidation state of the cerium. And so, so let me ask, and anybody can answer this, do, do you think the whole cerium oxide reduces under these conditions or just the surface? Anybody want to make a bold statement? If the whole particle reduces, then you're going to get the structure of what uh, happens. Once you start, you can partially reduce it or fully reduce it. You could start to look at structural changes. If it's only a monolayer, like in platinum, it's only a monolayer, it becomes much harder. You have to have smaller, thinner particles. I guess okay. the series is going to reduce bulk. Bulk. Oh, that, that would be really interesting you know, then you can really see structural changes and, and you could do the reversibility. You could start to oxidize slowly and, and do things like that. Absolutely. And, and with dopants in there, you can figure out where they go and what they're interacting with and what's different. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, since, you know, before we, we end up here, if, if we ever get back to the beam lines, which I hope we will summer or fall, um, if anybody wants to do experiments, I usually get beam time and I'm happy to try a few things that you think are useful. It's, it's great to try these out and see what works and what doesn't. Maybe you'll have to adjust your sample prep or sample conditions to give us smaller, different particles, whatever. But once we figure out how to run the samples and get the information you're looking at, lanthanum in this case or cerium, um, then we can start to do more things and start to do them in situ and start to do whatever else. Yeah, so to, yeah, if you good. have a need, please, please send me an email. I know it's kind of tough in these big group meetings to speak up, but send me an email after the fact. I know Fabio and Andre talk to me all the time. You can send them emails and they can forward on your message. Don't, don't be bashful here. Okay, yeah, Take, thanks, Jeff. We will be the, the intermediate. And uh, yeah, we are, we are looking forward to, to, to send you some samples. Yes, we have, I think what Fabiana, uh, Fabiana mentioned is that we, we want to see like selective, we, we have catalysts with different land annual concentrations and we want to, and they have different selectivities. So we want to see what, what's going on. And, and yeah, absolutely. In, in the structure absolutely. as a function of the, actually we, it's not actually dopant, it's, you could call it as an alloy. We put as much as 50, 70% of lantanium. So it's actually the, the full range of alloying 
we are studying. So well, in, 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 in that case, it might be better to do something like, you know, institute a fraction. I don't know. If there yep. are these solid solutions like zirconium Syria, or are these mm. you think they're different phase structures or or what? Oh, it depends. It depends on the way you make the, the particles. You can get solid solutions and you can get different phases. So yeah, that's what we were studying. Depending on, on how we synthesize that, then. But we can get solid solution up to 70% of Montanum. So it's, it's really amazing. Yeah, well, then your Syria becomes the dopant and then it becomes the. Yeah, the exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's okay Which with is, me too. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, more questions? Uh, I, some somebody from YouTube. No, if not, I think. Do you want to make some announcement? First, I'd like to thank again very much for for your very kind lectures, both uh, Professor Fernando and Professor Jeffrey. It was very nice, very instructive. I, I hope everybody enjoyed it, and. Uh, we are looking forward to schedule the full the full package, right, Jeff Miller? If the the, the full workshop, that would be nice. And uh, okay, I, I'd like to have a, a, a an applause for all the, uh, the our short course lectures again, please. Yeah. Thank Very you. nice. Yeah. Uh, Once again, thank, be... thanks for the invitation. I had a I had a good time. I enjoyed your talks as well. Okay, thanks. Great to find out what you guys are doing. That's okay. Hopefully very nice. we can start to collaborate on some stuff and help you help everybody move along. Look forward right. to it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Fernando and Jeffrey, we, we thank you very much. We, we we may come up with ideas of extended, not so short courses, but you know, um, it's an honor for us, and I think it's a great opportunity for our students to have guys like you. To willing to, to share your knowledge, all the skills that you guys have accumulated and is still very active and, and excited about the science you're producing. That makes us very happy. And uh, we will be more than happy to invite you again. Eventually we can we know, design together some kind of uh, slightly longer courses for, 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 for you guys to share with us. That will be something very nice. For now, I, I, I hope you, you, you have enjoyed your time. Thank you very much. Stay safe. And we keep in touch with our collaboration. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye, Professor. But so tomorrow, I, I, yeah, I think we should announce that tomorrow we won't have the Zoom. Yeah. Please, Professor Fernando and Professor Jeff Miller, uh, tomorrow we'll have a series of three seminars, one from Professor Lana Flavia, she will talk about perovskites, uh, solar cells, uh, another one from Doug, I think he'll talk about uh, catalysts, right, uh, Fabio? Uh, uh, MOFs? Yes, MOFs. Metal Organic is a collaborator from our uh, low temperature groups. And also Professor Fabio Ribeiro, he'll talk uh, more about the C star, which is also uh, where uh, Professor Jeff Miller is part of, of the, the project as well. So just to remind you that uh, uh, we won't be using the Zoom tomorrow. We'll be using the YouTube uh, platform and you have that uh, on, this, on the chat and we'll have the, the links on the website of the workshop as well. Perfect. So we invite everybody to, to, to come back tomorrow. So thank you very much. See you tomorrow for the last session of a workshop. Have a good evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.